Okay, thanks everyone. We're going to get started so we can be on time. Um, if you're planning on doing public comment, please sign in. And if you're in person or type your name in the chat, uh, there'll be time for public comment at the end of this meeting. And any additional questions or public comments can be sent to our email at pab at agr.wa.gov. Yeah. Um, and if you have any questions, you can and you're uh, virtually joining us, please type in the chat. Make sure your camera is turned off and your mic is muted while others are presenting. And this meeting's being recorded. Here's the agenda for today. We'll have a lunch break at 12.10, and we'll start again at 12.30. At the end of this meeting, there will also be polling um, for planning the next meeting. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Kelly McLean. Okay. Yeah, so if we could have everybody sign in, I need your name and your signature. Otherwise, I don't get reimbursed for the lunch I bought you. So it's really helpful if you all sign um, on the sheet that Director Sanderson has. That would be awesome. Uh, so good morning and thank you all for coming to the first in-person but also hybrid first uh, meeting of the of the Pesticide Advisory Board. Uh, this is really exciting for me. I'm going to go ahead and date myself a little bit. I was actually Ecology's rep on the Pesticide Advisory Board back in the mid-2000s in the, of the old board. Um, so um, it's exciting to me uh, to be able to welcome you here today to the, the reboot of this. You're going to hear a little bit about that from uh, from Representative Dent, who, who sponsored the bill and has been a huge advocate for this process, and from our director as well. Um, I am the newly appointed uh, Assistant Director for the Agricultural Environmental Services Division, which is a renamed division at the Department of Ag. It includes all of the pesticide programs that you're gonna hear about today, plus a couple others. Um, as you see on here, that in, it includes our Dairy Nutrient Management Program, our Technical Services and Education Program that covers predominantly our, our farm worker training programs, um, our train the trainer programs, uh, and um, a lot of work uh, with bilingual farm workers staff on farms, our pesticide compliance program, which you'll hear from today, a pesticide and fertilizer registration program, our licensing and recertification program, our natural resources and egg sciences program, and our cannabis office, which includes our home program. So it's it's pesticide plus. It's a much bigger program going a big bigger division going forward. Um, but uh, we're really excited about the opportunity to have a pesticide advisory board talk about the work we're doing in pesticides. I think um, a lot of people in the room are aware there's been a lot of interest from stakeholders, from the general public, and from legislators around pesticides over the last six to seven years. Um, and so uh, for the I think the last time I did a search, there was something like 120 times the word pesticide had come up in the legislative process in, in a very short time period. So uh, for me, it's exciting to have a space where we can talk to you all and how it relates to your work or to your agency's work um, or to your personal life um, and how we can make really good decisions going forward. And with that, I am done. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. I really appreciate everybody's active participation on this board. I'm here as your chair, so if there's anything you would like to discuss, please email or phone me. Um, open door policies.
So I'm going to talk about an introduction to the agenda and the process that we're going to follow for this board. So today we have speakers today, we have Representative Dent. We thank you very much for your dedication and all that you did to make this board available during a time when it's so critical for pesticides and all that's going on with pesticides. So thank you, Representative Dent. And then we have Director Sanderson. We're excited to have him here as well. We thank you for your support and all that your team has done for this board making us available. Then we'll have the program managers, as Kelly described, they'll come and talk to us about the overview of what they're doing at Department of Agriculture. We felt as we put this agenda together, it was really important for you to understand what their breadth is, what they're doing, and then um, we'll be able to better service what they're doing. And then we'll have lunch, and after lunch, we'll have um, a couple of department of or a couple of agencies that have roles in pesticides, highlight what they do with pesticides, so you can understand. Here in Washington State, there's a lot of people that have authority and, and have their hands in pesticides. We thought that was important as well. So any questions on the agenda? Okay. So Pesticide Advisory Board was reestablished in the 2023 legislature and to advise the pesticide managed division of WSDA on activities and actions related to the division's plans and actions on ongoing and emerging significant issues related to pesticides in Washington State. We're here to, as an advisory committee for the Washington State Department of Agriculture, driven by RCW uh, 21 and the director appoints each member of the uh, advisory committee. It'll be a four year term when we get up and running. We got it staggered right now at the start and they, the director seeks nominations and selected both voting members and non-voting members. So the director may also remove any member of the board before their expiration, if there is cause, and shall attempt to fill that within 30 days. Voting members will offer recommendations, we'll discuss as a group, and they'll offer recommendations, and if needed, we will vote on those. And uh, voting members could also recommend a work group. So if we have a real meaty topic or one that we feel that needs we need to take a deeper dive, we can make a recommendation, recommendation to the director and then he can go through the process of, of forming that work group. And we wanna let you know that that work group may not be, it may be outside of the Pesticide Advisory Board Committee to bring in the experts that we need to work on that committee. So I wanna set some ground rules to be fair. What's going on? Coffee just came in for anybody who needs coffee in the back. Thank you, Julia. We'll have you raise your hand to speak or put a question in the chat for speaking. And we wanna keep the comments and questions down to two minutes. That'll be fair. We have a very diverse group here. And we wanna make sure that there's enough time for everybody to have their um, time to speak. For public comment, sign in for submitting public comment at the beginning. You must provide, you must sign in to provide comment questions. And we'll switch back and forth between online and in-person. So we'll go in order that they will receive. And you can, if we run out of time, we, we have a uh, email. Anybody can submit written comments and questions to that email. There's not enough time for everybody to have the email here. Any questions about ground rules or in general about the site advisory? All right, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Representative Ben. Thank you, Wendy. Appreciate that. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. That was pathetic. <laughs> Let's do that again, okay? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Right on, that's better. <laughs> Audience participation really works for me. So, you know, I'm uh, passionate about agriculture. And I'm passionate about pesticides, as I sat in a spray plane for, for more years than I can remember, well over 40. And uh, I know the importance of them. And, and I'm passionate about keeping them because we need them. So uh, this is going to come as some bad news to you, but there's 147 members of the legislature. And the guy you're looking at is the lead on pesticides among 147 people. So 
that's the best we could do. That's what we got. So I appreciate all the backup I can get from you folks when we do this, because truly other members ask me, you know, how this works and what we can do about pesticides. And, and uh, uh, the word pesticide just strikes fear into the average person on the street. Just strikes fear. And we know that. And uh, actually we had a bill this year uh, that we changed the word pesticide and inserted insecticide because we were dealing with an insecticide, but it was easier and more palatable for members to vote on it when it said insecticide. Okay, so that, that's the power of words. So, uh, you know, this is a, an important committee. Um, um, I'm really glad that we were able to get the legislation through and it wasn't easy. It took two years. The first year we allowed the committee to grow a little too big. We as in me, okay. Uh, Kelly, who I worked with closely to do this, kept saying, it's getting too big, Tom. <laughs> well, I know, but, uh, you know, we have a lot of issues here. But uh, it did, it got too big and it died. So when we uh, started over again last year in 23, we, we pared it down to where it was more manageable. Uh, just so you know, I'm still hearing about it from the folks that aren't included on this committee that they wanted to be included. And I said, we're going to have some non-voting spots for you but please reach out to the members that are on the committee because everybody wants to do this and they're willing to represent every aspect of the pesticide industry, which is relatively large. We use pesticides about everywhere. So, uh, you know, that's that's kind of the, the basis for that. Uh, that and the stakeholders, we need stakeholders, the people in the field, you're the ones that are using this stuff. We, you need to be part of this conversation and not just let somebody else do this. You know, you can't let 147 members of the legislature, along with uh, whatever's in the Department of Agriculture, drive something that you have the expertise in. And that's one of the reasons we wanted to do this. And uh, I'll give you an example here. You know, we were looking here a couple of years ago uh, at some uh, herbicide laws and, and regulations, and they're all by county. And are some of these things been outdated uh, as, our, as our rules change, the way we apply things change, the apparatus has changed, the nozzles have changed, a lot of changes. And this might be, a, a Kelly and I talked, this might be a perfect topic for this group to take a look at. Do we need to revisit some of these regulations or are they okay? But you know, let's do what's right because I know some of them, some of the regulations that are out there, I studied in the 70s when I was, you know, when I got my, uh, my license and uh, they haven't changed. And uh, are, are they good ones or not? Let's take a look and because uh, things change. So, you know, I, I uh, really appreciate the fact that we have this group now that, and that you all folks can take a look because you're the experts. And the second part of that is if we have pesticide bills come into the, into the legislature, I may call on some of you to come and uh, help me a little bit because I need that too. You know, it's not just, uh, it can't just be Tom running around talking to 146 other members, tell them how great this stuff is, okay? Um, it's good to have a little backup. So with that, um, I wanna thank you for your willingness to be on this committee and to serve, because it's very important. It's to all of us in agriculture. And you know, I didn't think about it before, but you know, they treat the poles that go in them on the piers in the Puget Sound with a pesticide. Things of that nature, which you, you know, I didn't think about some of those things and they wanted to be on this committee and unfortunately we couldn't make that work, but there's just a zillion places where we use pesticides. So there's a lot of topics, there's a lot here to learn and it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna be a great time and an opportunity for you folks to weigh in on what is going on in our lives. And that's what's important because you can, you can make a difference and be a part of the solution. So, um, so you know, I'm I'm presently the ranking member on the on the House Ag and Natural Resources Committee. It's uh, the most nonpartisan committee we have in the legislature. We work hard to uh, to maintain that. Uh, we're not sure what next year we'll bring because we're having some changes in the membership of the committee. But hopefully, we can maintain um, what we've been able to do in the past because it's so important to work these things out. Uh, with a pragmatic way, pragmatic direction. So, you know, that being said, there's one more thing I'm gonna say and, and um, I'll get scolded later by Kelly. <laughs> I'm concerned, mental health and suicide is a big part of my life and I'm concerned with that, what's going on in the agricultural sector in the United States of America has the highest suicide rate of any sector 
country. And that concerns me a lot because we're, we're proud people. Uh, we do it our own way. We grew up hearing the words, suck it up, buttercup, go get her done, right? And um, so, but when we lose people, because the stress becomes unbearable, doesn't work. And, and uh, uh, that's the, something I accomplished this year is we put together a work group through the Department of Agriculture. They were so willing to do this, to study uh, the uh, suicide rate and what's happening in agriculture. And why am I saying this in a pesticide meeting? Well, it's simply, uh, I want, I'm gonna ask a favor of everybody here and online. Pay attention to your friends. Watch them. When you see a change, talk to them. Maybe they need a hug. Maybe they just need, maybe things are bad. Things are going tough. It's a tough world, this agriculture. You know, I have a small ranch up there and it's paid for. And my tractor's paid for. And my other tractor's paid for. And everything's paid for. And it's not making any money. Now, it'd be better if it was bigger. I grow hay and raise buffalo. But, uh, I'm not making any money. So I get some of these guys that are bigger, not making money and the stress they're under. So watch out for all your friends around the agriculture sector because maybe, maybe just a kind word, a hug, how you doing today can make a difference. Can make a difference. And I'm, ex I'm extremely right now, um, I'm really raw right now. Uh, I lost a friend about two weeks ago to suicide. And, uh, and I've been talking to him. And you can't always say, but you know what? At least we talked. And uh, so pay attention. And if you, maybe you can save a life, that would be great. But uh, I would approve it. If you ever need anything like that or anything in agriculture, questions, wants, desires, you want me to come to a group or whatever, please reach out. I'm always available to do that. That's my job. And uh, I'm happy to do that. So again, thank you, Kelly, for having me. Thank you, uh, Department of Agriculture, for supporting this legislation. I think it's going to do good things. And uh, um, let's have a good day. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. Really appreciate it. Those in the room and also those attending virtually. Um, great uh, to have this kind of turnout. Uh, I want to uh, thank Representative Bent for hard work on uh, uh, in gross substitute House Bill um, 1019. Uh, very important piece of legislation. Um, and it, as he said, it took two years, 22 and 23, to get uh, to get the, uh, the bill passed. And so um, we're really pleased to have pesticide advisory board back in operation it it was in operation up until 2010 um and then um, statutes changed and so it, it was eliminated but now again great deal it's back we're really appreciative of that um i think you know it's really important um just given the amount of pest pressures that we face in agriculture i mean there's numerous problems we're, we're dealing with right now today that are threatening um, various segments of the ag industry. And so we wanna make sure we have all the tools in the toolbox that we need to be able to deal with those pest pressures. And uh, uh, again, being able to, to look under the hood and make sure that all of our programs are operating properly and that we're providing um, safeguards for the public and for the environment, uh, very important. Um, and and uh, it, there was reference made to the new division that we created. It's not a new division, it's a renamed division, but Kelly McLean that we've been used to um, working our, our pol in our policy shop is now the assistant director for uh, the, new, the new division, which is um, Agricultural Environmental um, Service Division, or Services Division, I should say. Um, and that also pulled in our, um, our natural resource and ag science um, program, which Gary Beal has been running. Uh, and so it, it kind of broadens the scope, but also adds some horsepower with respect to technical skills. So I think it's a great change. We're really pleased that Kelly was willing to take that on and uh, she'll still be available to work um, uh, related issues in the legislature, but uh, 
again, we're, we're looking forward to her leadership in this, uh, in, in bringing this new division to, uh, to fruition. Um, so again, just want to extend my appreciation for all of you being here, for your interest in the subject and your commitment to, uh, to uh, helping us make sure that we manage um, our, our pesticides properly. So thank you. Thank you. Good day. All right, now moving on to a training video. All right, so this is about 18 minutes long and a requirement. So we're going to view this training. Muted. Yeah. yeah. There we go. Wait, you have to mute your computer. Okay. Better. 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 Nope. Yes. 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 This doesn't end. Yes. So if this doesn't end up, we're finished. We can skip it. But I'm going to need to use two fields and public meetings that train. A bunch of us have probably had it. And stop sharing. Stop sharing. Okay. Okay. Wait. Okay, wait. The purpose of the act is to provide the Hello, I'm Assistant Attorney General Morgan Damro. This training provides an overview of the Open Public Meetings Act. It's intended for both the public and public agencies. Our purpose in this training is to provide a greater understanding of the legal requirements of the Open Public Meetings Act. 
The act was passed in 1971, a time of a nationwide effort to make government affairs more accessible and more responsive. The purpose of the act is to provide the public access to information concerning the conduct of state and local government. The law is based on the principle that open government is essential to our free society. The Open Public Meetings Act gives the people of Washington State the opportunity to witness the deliberations and decisions of government. More recently, that's included an opportunity to provide public comment as part of that process. Multi-member governing bodies of state and local agencies, such as school boards, city and county councils, and the state commissions must comply with the Open Public Meetings Act. The law states that it is intended that the actions of these governing bodies be taken openly and that their deliberations be conducted in an open manner. Meetings subject to the act must be open to the public gavel to gavel unless the law permits a meeting or part of that meeting to be closed. Thank you for watching and I hope you find this training informative. This training's purpose is to increase your knowledge of the Open Public Meetings Act. The OPMA is in Chapter 4230 of the RCWs, and this training incorporates updates from the 2022 legislative session. This training video contains 15 short segments. We just discussed Section 1, the history, and Section 2, the purpose of the Act. The remaining segments we will review the scope of the OPMA, what is a governing body, what is a meeting, what is action and final action, travel and gathering, regular meetings, special meetings, remote meetings. We'll also talk about executive sessions, public attendance and comment, minutes, liability, as well as other laws and, and provide some additional resources to assist you. The Act has several clear requirements and compliance with them is improved with training. Training can mean the difference between meeting your agency's OPMA obligations and expensive litigation. The Act applies to governing bodies of multi-member public agencies, both state and local. At the state level, public agency includes state boards, commissions, committees, departments, educational institutions, or other state agencies, which is created by or pursuant to statute. Public agency does not include the courts or the legislature. For local governments, public agency includes any county, city, school district, special purpose district, or other municipal corporation or political subdivision of the state of Washington. Examples of these include city councils, county councils, school boards, and fire district boards. Public agency may also include a sub-agency of a public agency, which is created by or pursuant to statute, ordinance, or other legislative act. A good example of these includes planning commissions, library or park boards, or commissions. A final group is any policy group whose membership includes representatives of publicly owned utilities formed or pursuant to Washington laws when meeting together or as or on behalf of participants who have contracted for the output of generating plants being planned or built by an agency operating them. In some cases, an entity which is not an agency may still be subject to the OPMA when it is the functional equivalent of a public agency. This determination depends on whether it performs a governmental function, receives governmental funding, the extent of governmental involvement or regulation, and whether the entity was created by government. Some activities of public agencies are not subject to the OPMA. They include certain licensing and permitting activities, quasi-judicial matters, matters governed by the Washington State Administrative Procedures Act, and certain collective bargaining activities. All meetings of the governing body of a public agency shall be open and the public and all persons shall be permitted to attend any meeting of the governing body of the public agency, except as otherwise provided in the OPMA, such as during a declared emergency. A governing body is defined as a multi-member board, commission, committee, council, or other policy or rulemaking body of a public agency, or any committee thereof when the committee acts on behalf of the governing body, conducts hearings, takes testimony, or public comment. Agencies governed by an individual, such as a single director, are not subject to the OPMA. Meeting means meetings at which action is taken. Physical presence of the members is not required. A meeting can occur by phone or in some cases by email. I will talk more about email exchanges later in this training. A meeting does not need to be titled meeting. The OPMA also applies to retreats, workshops, and study sessions. In order for there to be a meeting, there must be a quorum of the governing body. 
A meeting does not occur if there is no quorum. We have talked about the fact that the OPMA applies to a governing body at a meeting. In order to qualify as a meeting, the governing body must take action. Action means the transaction of the official business of a public agency by a governing body, including but not limited to receipt of public testimony, deliberations, discussions, considerations, reviews, evaluations, and final action. A subset of action is final action. Final action means a collective positive or negative decision or any actual vote by a majority of the members of a governing body when sitting as a body or an entity upon a motion, proposal, resolution, order, or ordinance. Final actions must occur in public. Secret ballots are not allowed. A majority of the members of a governing body may travel together or gather for purposes other than regular meetings or special meetings, so long as no action is taken. And remember, action includes discussion of agency business. This means a quorum of members can travel to a meeting together, or they can gather at a public or private event, such as a festival or social function, so long as they do not collectively discuss agency business or matters. In the next segments, we are going to talk about the types of meetings where a governing body may meet. The first is regular meetings. Regular meetings are recurring meetings held in accordance with a periodic schedule by ordinance, resolution, bylaws, or other rule. State agencies file these notices of regular meetings each year with the Office of the Code Revisor. Regular meeting agendas are to be posted online on an agency's website 24 hours in advance. A special purpose district or city or town is not required to post an agenda online if the agency has an aggregate valuation of property in the taxation district of less than 400 million, a population of less than 3,000, and provides confirmation to the state auditor when filing its annual report that the cost of posting notices to a website would exceed one-tenth of 1% 1 of the agency's budgets. These provisions exempting very small agencies changed in 2022. Certain notice requirements are required for special meetings. These include written notice 24 hours in advance of the meeting, provided to members of the governing body unless waived. The notice must be provided to local newspapers, radio, and TV stations that have a request on file with the agency. The notice must also be posted on the agency's website if it has a website. There is an exception for very small agencies, agencies with no FTEs or with no one whose job responsibilities, either by job description or by contract, with the responsibility to maintain or update the agency's website. The notice must be prominently displayed at the main entrance site and the meeting site unless the meeting is being held as a remote meeting or one where some or all members of the public are limited due to a declared emergency. The remote meeting provisions are new and we'll be addressing those in just a moment. The notice must specify the time, place, and business to be transacted. Unlike regular meetings where the agenda may be changed and final action taken on a matter which was added to the agenda, under special meetings, provisions, the governing body is prohibited from taking final action on any issue not on the original notice. There is an exception to the notice requirement for emergency special meetings. Those are meetings involving injury or damage to persons or property, or the likelihood of injury or damage, where time requirements make notice impractical and increase the likelihood of injury or damage. New in the OPMA through the 2022 amendments are provisions addressing a governing body holding remote meetings. After the declaration of emergency by a local or state government or agency or by the federal government, and the agency determines that it cannot hold a meeting of the governing body with members of the public in attendance with reasonable safety, the agency may either hold an all remote meeting without a physical location or hold a meeting with the governing body present, but some or all of the public excluded. In either of these instances, the agency must provide an option for the public to listen telephonically or by using a readily available alternate means in real time, such as an available television cable broadcast or the internet. Any option selected may not require any additional costs to access the program. If the agency does not provide an option, the agency is prohibited from taking action except for an executive session as authorized under the OPMA. If your agency is holding an all remote meeting with some or all of the public excluded, the notice of the meeting must include instructions on how the public may listen live to the meeting. 
an agency that held some of its regular meetings remotely prior to March 1st of 2020 may continue to do so with no declared emergency, so long as the agency provides an option for the public to listen as required for emergency remote meetings. Up to now, we've been talking about all the requirements to ensure openness and transparency. Under the OPMA, there are enumerated instances where the governing body may convene outside of the public's view in executive session, or if the governing body is discussing matters not subject to the OPMA. An executive session may occur as part of a regular or special meeting. The grounds for holding an executive session are limited to the purposes listed in the OPMA and are narrowly construed. The purpose of the executive session and the time it will end must be publicly announced before excluding the public and the time can be extended by further announcement. Examples of purposes include certain real estate transaction discussions, reviewing negotiations on publicly bid contracts, evaluating the qualifications of an applicant for public employment, and meeting with legal counsel regarding enforcement actions, litigation, or potential litigation. The OPMA provides a list of authorized executive session purposes at RCW 4230-110. An agency must carefully follow the law when meeting in an executive session. For example, when meeting in an executive session under the OPMA to discuss agency enforcement actions, litigation, or potential litigation, there are three requirements. First, legal counsel representing the agency must be present. Second, the purpose is to discuss an agency enforcement action, litigation, or potential litigation to which the agency, governing body, or a member acting in official capacity is a party or is likely to become a party. And finally, public knowledge regarding the discussion is likely to result in an adverse legal or financial consequence to the agency. Remember, an agency can discuss only those matters in an executive session under the OPMA that it has told the public it would discuss. The members cannot talk about other topics in that executive session. In addition to an executive session, a public agency can have a closed meeting to discuss matters not subject to the OPMA, such as deliberating on a quasi-judicial matter, or collective bargaining. Other laws may provide additional procedures or authority for particular meetings or hearings to be closed to the public. There may be additional laws for particular agencies as well. As we discussed, all meetings of the governing body of a public agency shall be open in public and all persons shall be permitted to attend any meeting of the governing body of a public agency, except as otherwise provided in the OPMA. An agency also cannot place conditions on attendance, such as requiring persons to register their names or fill out a questionnaire before attending. This provision does not prohibit any generally applicable condition determined by the governing body to be reasonably necessary to protect public health or safety or to protect against interruption of the meeting, including a meeting at which the physical attendance by some or all members of the public is limited due to a declared emergency. As noted, email or phone call discussions amongst members of a governing body can be a meeting under the OPMA. But the purpose of the OPMA is to permit the public to attend and observe agency meetings. So when the public is unable to attend email or phone call discussions that are meetings under the OPMA, the act has been violated. Recent amendments to the OPMA make it clear members of a governing body can participate in meetings remotely with no declared emergency. However, public attendance must be maintained. In doing so, it is generally agreed that public notice procedures must be satisfied and the agency has to set up a process for the public to attend, such as a speakerphone available at the agency's official meeting location so the public can hear the discussion. In contrast, since an email exchange amongst a quorum of the members of a governing body is not open to the public, such an exchange in which an action is taken is a meeting that would violate the OPMA. And remember, action is broadly defined. It is very difficult to envision a way in which those email exchanges comply with public notice or attendance requirements for a regular or special meeting. One of the 2022 changes to the OPMA is a requirement that public agencies receive public comment at or before every regular meeting at which final action is taken. The 2022 amendments allow agencies to accept public comment either by written format or orally. If the governing body chooses written public comment, it can be submitted before or at the meeting. Any written comment received must be distributed to the governing body. The governing body may set reasonable deadline for submission prior to the meeting. The oral comment option is very similar to what many agencies were doing voluntarily before the 2022 amendments. Agencies can put reasonable procedures in place to allow for public comment. 
This may include limits to the time available for public comment or limit comment to those topics on the agenda. However, a governing body may also choose to accept public comment on any topic. If oral public comment is taken by the governing body, it shall, when feasible, provide an option for remote public comment for individuals that have difficulty attending. Difficulty attending may be due to a disability, limited mobility, or for any other reason that makes physical attendance difficult. A governing body is not required to accept public comment that renders orderly conduct of the meeting unfeasible. The OPMA has procedures for dealing with disruptions where orderly conduct of the meeting is unfeasible. The minutes of all regular and special meetings, except executive sessions of such boards, commissions, agencies, or authorities, shall be promptly recorded and such records shall be open for public inspection. The OPMA does not require an audio or video recording of a meeting. Many agencies choose to do so. Public agencies are encouraged through the 2022 amendments to make audio or video recordings of meetings or to provide an online streaming option of all regular meetings of the governing body and to make any recordings that the agency does make available online for a minimum of six months. Violations of the OPMA can result in a lawsuit against an agency and its members. A court can impose a $500 civil penalty as personal liability against each member who knowingly violates the OPMA and a $1,000 penalty for a subsequent knowing violation. A court can also declare any action taken at a meeting not held in compliance with the OPMA null and void. And a court will award costs and attorney's fees to a successful party seeking a remedy under the OPMA. To recap, this presentation covers the highlights of the OPMA. Public agencies may be subject to other laws governing other particular meetings, hearings, procedures. Some agencies have particular laws that govern their meetings as well. Like the OPMA, the laws concerning agency meetings and hearings can also be amended from time to time. Therefore, agencies are cautioned to be mindful of all current laws concerning their meeting and hearing procedures. Thank you for watching the Attorney General's OPMA training. For more information, there are available resources for agencies to receive training and technical assistance for compliance with the Open Public Meetings Act. An official should first consult with his agency's counsel for routine assistance and training. Additional resources are listed on this website. The Assistant Attorney General for Open Government is also available to provide information about the Open Public Meetings Act. Hello, <laughs> just testing the mic. Um, so now we're going to have WSDA program managers introduce themselves and their programs. Um, please hold questions until they're done speaking. We'll have a time at the end um, after the program managers have presented for questions. And okay, all right, <laughs> one second, please. <laughs> Just uh, hold on a sec for technical difficulties. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay. I was going to say, but uh, whenever I start feeding the cook, it's going to be so good. So, morning, Scott. I know that's coming. I'll get three words in. Maybe. <laughs> It's on. Okay. Here's Scott Nielsen. Okay. Hello, everybody. I'm Scott Nielsen. I'm the uh, program manager for pesticide compliance. And because there's so many new faces and this whole uh, board being re put down after so many years, I'm really just going to give kind of an overview introduction to pesticide compliance. So what's our regulatory role uh, for the compliance program? We enforce the state laws and rules. And that's RCW 1558, the Pesticide Control Act, RCW 1721, Pesticide Application Act, the general rules that are all the kind of details uh, between those two acts. But then we also have the worker protection standard that we enforce. We've got bulk uh, pesticide containment uh, rules out there that we uh, enforce. We've got specific chemigation rules all across the state uh, that we enforce. And as Representative Dent mentioned, we've got our statewide and county specific rules that we have too, uh, mostly related to uh, herbicide restrictions and things. So we've got all those different things that we enforce in the uh, compliance program. All of this is under the umbrella um, of FIFRA, right? The, the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, or Denicide Act that allows for all uh, pesticide use and distribution in the United States. And so um, Washington is given primacy. So we're out there able to do our own stuff there. But at a minimum, we always have to enforce FIFRA. Just generally, you know, think of the pesticide labels and all that and those instructions. So we're always going to be enforcing that. And we do, in the compliance program, we do have sort of an oversight um, of EPA, an annual review to make sure we're meeting uh, those minimums and uh, an annual contract. There's really sort of three ways that we go out and do this. Um, the, the first one I'll talk about is inspections. We go out and do basically just routine inspection checks. And our staff are out doing what we call use inspections, both in the agricultural realm and the non-agricultural realm, where we're just looking for someone making an application. And we'll stop and, and visit with that person and just check to make sure, are they properly licensed? Are they using the right product or the right crop or the right um, residential situation, whatever it is, and just make sure that everything's going right. We have a checklist we go through. We, of course, do worker protection standard inspections at any farm, forest, nursery, greenhouse where, where those are applicable. We've got applicator inspections where we can just go into maybe to a place of business and make sure that the, the like a certified applicator has all the proper equipment, proper stuff, using uh, proper products and all of that. Again, proper licensing. Um, we do uh, dealer inspections, of course, any place that's distributing uh, and selling uh, pesticides. They need to be properly licensed and doing all that. So we into those places and do the uh, routine dealer inspections. Marketplace inspections. You, know, you could even go down to uh, Home Depot and, and Lowe's and Fred Meyer and buy um, the home and garden type products that are over there. All the pesticides you think of, uh, uh, Clorox and, and, and Lysols and uh, off for, you know, mosquitoes. Those are all general or home and garden type products that any anybody can sell. And so we're doing marketplace inspections there to make sure those are done right. School inspections. We've got our RCWs related to all the record keeping requirements and posting and things for school applications. So we do those types of inspections. Uh, bulk pesticide storage inspections, I mentioned, we go out and make sure that those are done right. <laughs> I lost the microphone for a minute. Um, uh, all kinds of containment for things, chemication systems, and now even, of course, uh, since I-502, cannabis grow operation inspections. We go into those uh, locations to make sure that they're properly using the right uh, pesticides and, again, following instructions and doing everything right. 
Of course, the other, uh, another way that we're out there is our compliance activities, right? We're also out there doing complaint investigations. We, we tend to call them cases. Um, anytime we receive a complaint of any sort of pesticide misuse or a loss of, of property or anything like that, um, we're obligated to respond to human exposure cases within 24 hours. Uh, working days, uh, respond to all other types of pesticide complaints within 48 hours. So we're always out uh, responding to these things. And again, both are agricultural and non-agricultural situations are involved with that. The third uh, way that we do a lot of this though is through technical assistance and education, okay? Uh, a big part of, of what we do um, our goal is just to get people in compliance, right? To make sure everybody's in compliance. There's lots of ways we can do it. So we can do it through outreach, education, as well as the regulatory actions I mentioned. I talked about those inspections and those cases that we do. We do have regulatory authority to take actions when necessary. We can go from, uh, you know, uh, verbal warnings to um, uh, just uh, notice of correction that there was a violation. It's a formal notice, no fine or anything associated with it. It's just a warning. Uh, but we can also, if we had to, issue civil penalties in those cases that warrant it. But we really try not to do that. Our whole focus is to go out and work with people, get out there. Uh, we're always out in the winter months, of course, doing like the recertification courses, the training courses, educating people. Big focus this year, of course, was introducing people to the Endangered Species Act information that's coming, the bulletins live that will eventually be coming out as required language on labels, and just trying to help applicators have some understanding of what to expect when those labels start to show up and how just to follow whatever uh, instructions are there. Primarily right now for salmon, it's in streams is, is what we've seen most of. But as we know, there's more of those coming with the endangered species more uh, of those restrictions coming. So there'll be more of that. And of course, any other outreach meetings that we're invited to, you know, whether it's stakeholder groups or parks or noxious weed meetings or any other group, we like to get out there and um, educate and just try to help on that side of it too, technical assistance. How we do this, um, spread throughout the state. We've got people at uh, satellite offices all around the state um, uh, reporting to three different area managers. We've got area one, area two, and area three, as you can see on the map there. And we've got people at offices and at home offices to have people sort of distributed uh, throughout the state to try to respond quickly. Uh, when we do get complaints and to be able to get out and do the inspections, get to know the, the applicators and the retailers and things in your area and build those relationships. Um, so we've got the three area supervisors. We've got um, one uh, quality assurance training. It's also our uh, UAV drone uh, coordinator. Um, we've got one case review officer for our, for our legal review type things, uh, one admin assistant, and then me as the program manager. So. That's all of us, and there's basically what I think 17 point, or excuse me, 7.9 million people now in the state of Washington, and so there's there's a lot of people out there for us to try to respond to and deal with their complaints. One of the areas that stakeholders in 2020 asked us to address and do more was surveillance in terms of pesticide applications that might be drifting or moving off target. And um, it's an area that we've done about, since that time, we've done about 20 of these uh, drift observation, what we call a limited ag use inspection. We're going to put a big focus on that this spring and summer and try to get more of those done. Where a lot of it is, is geared toward like air blast, blast applications because of the very nature of the, you know, the areas, air assist type applications. We're going to really try to focus these on anything, any sort of application we see that could be moving off target. And the goal here is just to issue like a quick warning or a notice of correction. Hey, you're drifting. You can see from this photo, it's going out off target. Maybe you want to go past through there quite a ways downrange of the intended target of those trees and just stop it before something worthless happens. Before we, uh, a car goes through that or a bicycle or, or something else occurs and try to prevent some things from happening by getting out and, you know, helping to catch some of those things and just get a warning out there to stop Look at what you're doing and, and redo it. And do it quicker than our normal regulatory process. Try to wrap that up in just maybe three, four days and get it done and, and, and notify them right away. 
Some of these that we've done have really been quite successful. Well, we will contact the owner uh, of the business, show them the photograph of what was taking place that day. And, uh, and they're like, oh, we didn't know. And then they go out and educate their crews. My final uh, slide here that I wanted to show you guys um, is just, you know, a commercial operator out making a landscape application, right? He's out there uh, treating this lawn. And this means a lot of different things to a lot of people. Representative Dent mentioned, you know, all the different uh, way that people perceive pesticides and stuff. A lot of you might look at this and just say, oh, there's a guy who's treating, treating some, some weeds in a lawn. But other people are going to look at that and see it as a, a threat to the environment. They're going to be you know, worried about different things. Certainly, if there's odors involved with this application, we might be getting a complaint. I look at the photo and see lots of things. I see an open window right there in the upper corner and uh, you know, in an AC unit. And if there's a brand new uh, newborn baby that just got brought home and is you know, three weeks old and is, and is in that nursery, and it's a strong, you know, phenoxy odor, I can almost guarantee we're going to get some kind of a complaint, right? An understandable concern, maybe, if, if it's strong. Um, you look at that photo, there could be raspberries, looks like, growing along that garage, or they get any, you know, somebody might call them with a concern about can I eat the raspberries, right, in the artist country. Uh, did this guy properly check the pesticide sensitive notice registry and make sure none of, you know, if he had to, or any of the neighbors notified? There's, there's a lot going on every time we do these inspections. Um, so that was really all I had is kind of a quick intro to what we do in the compliance program. And I will turn it over to our next one. I'm going to advance and see if I've got the right slide. There you go. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Brent Perry. I'm the program manager for the registration services program. I've been with the state for about 24 years, and Representative Dent, I'm thrilled to see that the Pesticide Advisory Board is being brought back. We have a Fertilizer Advisory Committee that we've had for mm, almost 25 years since the secondary containment rules came into, and we work very closely with industry, and we see how positive that influence is. So this is a great thing. So what I'm going to talk about today is just the registration program. So in the state of Washington, we register all the fertilizers, all the pesticides. We call adjuvants or spreader stickers or whatever you want to call them also a pesticide. That's a little bit different. All states don't, Washington does. We also register fertilizers in the state as well as house the fertilizer compliance program. Um, I'll speak to just a, a few of those. First of all, staffing. A lot of things have changed in the world of agriculture. New products, especially in the fertilizer area, people are talking about nutrients that didn't exist years ago. You know, is nickel actually a fertilizer? Well, in the state of Washington, it isn't, but in the European economic community, it is. So there's changes going on there. We need to adjust for that. A few years ago, we actually adopted a heavy metal rule that um, pretty cumbersome. Uh, without offering too many comments about it, but it's something that we need to address going forward because it's not realistic in the world today for the whole nation. We have heavy metal rules for fertilizer registration that are not appropriate for the rest of the nation. Everybody else is different, Washington stands alone. So there'll be changes going on there. And that's what our staffing needs really go for, is to make sure that we're in place to meet those needs as they come up. So I'm not going to spend uh, or spend a lot of time on the actual numbers of the staff. I'm going to talk about the program. So when we look at Washington State, and this number is changing all the time, people always ask us, how many pesticides do you guys have registered? Well, that number goes up and down. Companies register, companies pull registrations. There's things that come off for the, from EPA type stuff. Um, if you notice, the 15,000, and then right underneath that's fertilizer registrations. We think that's a pretty light number. We also think the spray adjuvant is a light number too. And the whole reason behind that is technology, and I'll get to that in a minute. But these are all the activities we do. Um, the one thing that you're gonna see in here, I believe Tina's gonna talk later, we reference licensing. Licensing to us is a bulk fertilizer distribution license. It is not a pesticide applicator's license. 
So I want to make sure I covered that for this meeting. Um, very much like compliance, we register uh, EPA products. They're all registered with EPA um, before we register, as well as a few state registrations. I'm not going to get into the details, but we are customer service for the compliance program. If they need to know something about a label, that's what we're here for. And I'm going to reference the technology that we're developing as we get there. The other thing that we need to do is we need to help products get to the market sooner. We need to get a registration done so those tools are available to those that are going to use them in the field. We need to be accurate and complete in that. I'm going to address that too. So, um, cute acronym, WALTER, Washington Agricultural Licensing and Tonnage Registration Program. This is the first database that we started to build to actually get into the 21st century. This is up and running. There's my license to uh, reference to licensing. Once again, that's the bulk distribution license. This gives us a better idea of fertilizer, where it is, who's got it stored, how many products they are, and what the heavy metals are with those products, questions we get every day. The thing that this is gonna allow us to do is have a forward facing website that anybody can get on and look up a fertilizer. They can see what's in the fertilizer and the fertilizer label, something that we didn't have before. That's up and running. It only took us about seven years to get there. <laughs> we generate a lot of data quickly. It tells us, if you look at the red, those are approved product registrations. That's what we like to see. We can see by comparison and type status. We can see the pending status. What a database does for you is give you data. Good data in, good data out. You can relate it when you're looking for data. What's in a product? Okay. Whoppers. This is the Washington Pesticide Registration. Database. Now it says sandbox right there. Today, on the way down here, Scott and I drove down from Spokane. I told him, hey, I'm going to get a call at 3 o'clock. We are actually making the decision to go live today with our pesticide registration database. It'll have all the same components that the fertilizer does. With one exception, we're gonna have an online payment process. When I started in the state 24 years ago, the first thing I asked Ted Maxwell was, why don't we take credit cards? <laughs> I came from private industry. I ran a couple of retail ag tents, lotlets, and the blues. I took credit cards for a quarter of a million bucks, and we couldn't. We are going to be able to. It's that far away. It's one of the first projects I had when I started in this job two and a half years ago. So it's it's going to really streamline the process, and it's going to take workload off of staff. And it's going to allow staff to do a more complete evaluation of a label and work with compliance staff or anybody else who has questions. It's going to free them up to actually be registration specialists like they are instead of processing paperwork. Hopefully, I say yes today at four o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> same process. You're going to see both of them look about the same. You're going to be able to generate a lot of data from this. Um, this, this is the first chunk or module, if you will, that we're putting in. There's going to be other modules that come, but our, our current database has been around for over 20 years. And there's a bunch of duct tape and haywire holding that together. Our IT department isn't sure every day if it's actually going to come back up. So we had to get something when our existing database failed, <laughs> which is going to be any day, and this is it. This is the first big bite of the module, but eventually we're going to get to where we are with everything forward facing. So you can see the label, you can see the product. It's going to be right out there for anybody to search. When I say forward facing, I mean a public website where you can log in and say, I want to say, see who makes round. Bear is going to come up and you'll be able to see a label. It's going to depend on how many labels, and we haven't quite got that developed yet. We have it mocked up, but it's going to be user friendly and it's going to be able to distribute a lot of info, show a lot of information quickly. Okay, 
I haven't spent a lot of time on what we do. We register products is really what it is. But one of the big changes that we're trying to get through with the whole program is a database objective. And it's having a platform that actually functions instead of registering products using SharePoint and two different databases. And then having a whole other process with file cabinets full of hard copies. So nobody knows where anything is. And when you lose staff, then you lose that knowledge. So one of the things that's come up, our very first thought was we wanted to be consistent. We wanted to be able for somebody to come behind and see what you do. Efficient. We want to move the needle quickly. With our fertilizer module that went live, we estimate that we've gained about 53% efficiency on what we used to do. And we don't even know where that module is yet. The compliance module for fertilizer was launched 13 months ago, and it's exponentially helped the program. I see it, Tina. <laughs> um, so efficiency, we wanted to be user friendly. That's that online portal. We wanted for people to be able to get on and renew a product without having to talk to a registration person and not having a registration person push paper. Uh, no workarounds. The current database we have, if somebody had an idea to work around the process, they worked around it, we don't have those. We want it to be straightforward. E-payments, what a novel idea to accept a credit card. <laughs> um, customer portal, once again, is efficiency. And easier access to company-specific information. Forward-facing, so people can see what we're actually up to. Uh, the program also, I'm Murray and Lita, uh, houses the cannabis products or pesticide products available for use on cannabis. We have that, that will appear on our website. And staff field trips. So I come from Production Ag. I like Production Ag. Most of my friends are farmers. One of the things that we noticed was, here we are the Department of Ag. We register fertilizers and pesticides. And we didn't have a lot of folks that actually knew about Ag. So within the program every year, we take some trips. We spend some time in a hop yard. We spend some time, so that's a secondary containment, uh, fertilizer storage facility outside of Cheney. So we're trying to get experience of our staff. People always say, why don't you hire ag kids? Well, we can't. It's hard to hire just about anybody. So what we're doing is we're exposing staff to ag. Uh, interestingly enough, I'm done with you now. When we were, <laughs> we were in the flus this last year outside of Rosalia, on a uh, wheat, lentil, and garbanzo farm. And one of the guys walked up to me and said, you know, I've seen these big green things because I went to WSU, but I never knew what they were. Okay. <laughs> he got to go for a ride in one. Well, he may have got to go for a ride in one. I just said that. <laughs> <laughs> we also, I'm proud to say, have a 54-year employee. <laughs> yes, I said that correctly. Shannon Lumsden's been with us for 54 years, and she does a ton of work. She knows where all the bodies are. <laughs> okay, we're not done. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, now we have a filio. I think. Um, Billy, if you want to unmute, I can. Share Savannah, I can screen. I can share my screen and handle things from here if uh, if that works for you. Okay, yeah, that works. Excellent. All right, let me know if you uh, if you can see my screen and yes. if you can hear me. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, it is it is uh, a pleasure for me to be here. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thanks, Savannah, for all the work that you've done to put this together, and others. Um, so, I my name is Alfredo Borges. I um, I have been with the Department of Ag for about uh, 24 years. I've been a migrant farm worker in the states of uh, California, Oregon, and Washington. And I am a farmer, so all my life has been linked to farming. 
Um, and I can um, I can understand what uh, Representative uh, Dent was talking about when uh, he spoke about uh, managing stress. So, um, and um, also the suicidal prevention uh, issue, very important. So, anyhow, um, I managed the set uh, the technical services and education program uh, for our uh, division. And these are the topics that I will be talking about uh, covering during my presentation. Uh, since it is a relatively new program, I figure I would provide a little bit of a background. Um, I will talk about the model that we use and how this program has evolved over the years. So um, the, um, a little bit of background, the technical services and education program uh, was actually created uh, or became a standalone program in 2015. And our mission is to provide bilingual Spanish and English uh, pesticide related training and technical assistance um, for the proper use of pesticides and uh, proper use and disposal of pesticides. So, um, okay, I can't. I can't advance this anymore for some reason. Thought I could handle them from over here, but apparently not. Oh, uh, thank you. Did you do that, Savannah? All right, well, I'm, I'm gonna keep going. So, um, this program started as a, a farm worker education unit that was part of our licensing and recertification program back in uh, 2000, actually, yeah, 2001. So um, again, it became a standalone program within the division in 2015. Many of you probably have not heard about the program. Um, in 2015, the Waste Pesticide Disposal Program became under the umbrella of the Technical Services and Education Program. And it has worked out really well because most of the uh, pesticide waste disposal collections take place in the summer and most of the education takes place in the winter. So the programs complement each other really well. So I'm, I'm very happy about that. Um, uh, the demand for education, specifically pesticide safety education, uh, grew significantly. Uh, we uh, grew out of capacity. I mean, back um, in um, 2001, we only had two positions, actually one and a half positions. And um, we basically cured, uh, created a monster that we did not know what to do. The industry was so hungry for pesticide safety education that uh, we needed to get um, more fundings and more funding, and we needed to be creative. Um, we need to find a way to stretch our resources. And uh, based on that, we create the model that we have now, and it has worked out really well for us. So uh, the model that we use is uh, we collaborate with growers, grower organizations, pesticide distributing companies, educational institutions and other government agencies um, in order for us to stretch our, our resources. And, um, you know, our, in, during our model, um, our collaborators do most of the work for us. Um, they recruit participants, they provide facilities, they provide food and do all the logistical work. Uh, basically, we just come in and do all the trainings. So we do provide the instructors and some of the equipment. Um, so it has worked out really well. It has allowed, again, to stretch uh, our resources and uh, offer more training opportunities. This model um, uh, also allows community engagement. Um, people feel good about uh, being part of this effort. Um, uh, we partner with whoever uh, wants to work with us. So um, our present, we have uh, 12 FTEs, thanks to the additional funding. Um, most, all of our um, uh, staff members, but one are bilingual. Um, they speak Spanish and English and provide services in both languages. Um, 
We have seven bilingual programs, including on-farm technical assistance, uh, especially with air blast calibration. So we're uh, trying to help all these farmers before Scott uh, staff gets there. Um, so um, we uh, we provide um, a train the trainer. We figure we cannot train every single farm worker and every pesticide handler in the state. So we um, created the WPS train the trainer program after a uh, national model. Um, and uh, we trained pesticide handlers. We trained uh, people who use respirators. And, and again, all of these training programs are uh, offered in both English and Spanish. Uh, this year, we have partnered with uh, about 40 entities. Uh, so very happy about that. And um, we, uh, we're heading towards the end of uh, the training season, which starts in November. It ends in uh, mid-April. We um, have participated in about 50 events so far and trained uh, more than 5,000 people. So, and, and uh, we also collect about 70,000 pounds of waste pesticides per year. So uh, we keep busy all year round. Um, with that, I, I have to say that, um, and I'm very proud to say that we have probably the most robust training program in the nation. Um, currently, we are working with the Washington State Tree Fruit Association uh, to develop what we call agricultural leadership program. Um, so uh, in this program, we are um, hoping to change mentalities and we're hoping to, to take agriculture to the next level where every supervisor and manager um, are proactive, take um, uh, challenges in a very proactive manner. We um, also cover conflict resolution. We cover emotional intelligence, uh, communication, delegation, stress management. Uh, we are finishing uh, a cohort and it's pretty amazing the things that we hear. This is, this is an opportunity for a lot of people to talk about their lives. Um, it's pretty touchy. So um, I was a farm supervisor manager and um, for the most part, supervisors and managers do not receive this type of training, how to deal with this uh, type of situations. They face this type of situations on a daily basis. And um, we wanna see, we want supervisors and managers to see all this pesticide safety issues. Uh, in a very proactive manner. Um, so we are in the process of working with uh, the Washington State Tree Fruit. We have piloted this program. We're in the process of uh, trying to find ways to make it sustainable. So very happy uh, about how things are developing for um, our technical services and education program. And that's all I have uh, right now. So Savannah, you, uh, I think the next one is Christina um, with, uh, with licensing. Okay, all set. Is um can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I didn't 
your response, but I'll, so I'll just keep going. Um, hi, my name is Tina Zimmerman. I'm the program manager for licensing and recertification here at WSDA. I've been with the agency about seven years now. N next month will make seven years. Um, and I came from the Hawaii Department of Agriculture in the pesticide product registration. Um, and I just wanted to share with you um, a little bit about what we do here at the licensing and recertification program uh, on a daily basis and um, what projects we're working on. I think the slide kind of moved backwards a bit. There we go. I'm on slide one. Um, I realized when I shortened this presentation that I removed my contact information uh, slide so I can add that into the chat later. Um, so this program has four key areas of work that I kind of wanted to lay out for you uh, if you don't are if you're not familiar with licensing and recertification. So CNT and exam development really focuses on the certification standards uh, for our licensees and assuring uh, that our uh, competency standards align with federal requirements. So what are competency standards? That term is going to be thrown around a lot in the coming months and years as we um, align with uh, updated federal standards. So competency standard is a topic that is taught in the manual and covered on our pesticide licensing exams. So these are areas that EPA has identified as important for applicators to know to be quote unquote competent or to be able to do the job safely uh, with minimal risk to themselves, the public or the environment. So EPA requires that pesticide licensees learn or are tested in uh, these specific competency standards um, of pesticide application and safety to obtain, actually obtain their license. Washington State currently has 12 different license types and 31 different license categories, meaning uh, so that will cover various types of work from an ag worker, uh, applying pesticides, a pest management professional, a landscape company, a public operator, or irrigation district, um, so it covers a broad range of activities. Uh, to meet these certification needs, we have 33 individual certification exams, 39 if we include the Spanish versions uh, of these exams that we do have available. Uh, staff, uh, we have a team of three that do spend a great deal of time reviewing exam material, uh, the accompanying study manuals from WSU, uh, which the exams are based on. Uh, the amount of time spent on this area of work has drastically increased uh, with changes over the past few years from EPA, and I'll go over that in just a bit. So recertification um, is another area of work for our program. So once an individual is licensed, uh, they must maintain their license through recertification, which entails either retesting in all the categories that they need or earning continuing education credits. So the same three staff that are working on uh, developing policy, uh, exam development at CNT are also responsible for developing policies for the accreditation of courses, as well as um, reviewing and accrediting those courses. So they typically accredit over 1700 course sessions a year. Um, and this effort also includes uh, auditing courses um, to assure that they're actually following our recertification policies. Um, uh, compliance does help quite a bit with that as they do attend uh, recertification courses as a presenter, so they do uh, assist with the auditing. Uh, this accreditation involves review of the course materials, communication with the course sponsor, um, and determining if the course agenda and materials really align <laughs> with our federal recertification standards. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Is that that change? We can hear you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hi. Okay. Um, Sorry, we yeah. um, cut out over here for a minute. Um, okay. But keep going. Okay. 
<laughs> OK, so the next area of work for this program is exam administration and processing. So program staff, um, they also spend a significant amount of time on exam delivery and processing. So as we talked about, individuals must pass exams to obtain their license, recertify, recertify or to add a category um, that they need to do their work. Uh, WSDA provides weekly testing in Olympia and Yakima, uh, monthly testing in Spokane, Burlington, and Moses Lake, and bi-monthly testing in East Wenatchee. The compliance program staff helps to cover monthly testing in Spokane, Moses Lake, and Burlington, as we do not have licensing staff anywhere near those, those areas. So we're really thankful for that. Um, WSDA administers approximately 10,000 exams per year. These are solely paper-based exams graded only in two locations, Olympia and Yakima, and reviewed and processed by three customer service positions in Olympia, one of which is currently vacant for now. So we have two staff processing all of those exams uh, and testing paperwork. We are interviewing for that position uh, next week. Um, so this brings us to customer service. Uh, we have five customer service positions uh, that not only provide exam administration, and, but answer phone calls and emails from all of our 25,000 plus current licensees and thousands of testers or potential licensees. Uh, despite the heavy workload and with help from our specialists on the program that do exam development, um, to cover testing needs, the staff are still able to return most calls and emails within 24 hours and others no longer than 48 hours after we receive them. Could we go to the next slide, Savannah? Thank you. So we have a lot going on already, but there are three large concurrent projects we are also working on. So I'll start with the first one, which is might be the least interesting for you is Wappler. Uh, it's Washington Pesticide Licensing and Recertification Database. So our older database, PM Licensing, was running on Internet Explorer 8. Um, so we couldn't even use our new machines um, to access that database. And so we luckily were able to launch phase one of the new database Wappler in January of this year. So phase one is just pretty much doing everything we could already do with PM licensing, just more efficiently, more streamlined processes, cleaner um, user interface. So phase two is really the more fun stuff where we're having enhancements um, to the system where licensees, if you are a licensee um, or a company owner with licensed uh, employees, will be able to access that information through a secured portal, make updates to your records in that way, no printing out documents, uh, filling it out, and then email, scanning an email. It's really kind of antiquated. It's 2024. We really need to get um, move forward with this. So that's we're looking forward to that being completed next spring. Um, this also will include integration of data from our computer based testing vendor, um, which is I think a lot of people are looking forward to. Um, we are starting staff training next week for our computer based testing platform, and that is through Metro. Uh, Metro Institute is the vendor that provides computer based testing in Idaho and Oregon, as well as 12 other states for pesticide licensing. So it's a great partnership to start with. We have 11 secured, trained, and ready to go locations throughout the state with four others pending and more to be added at a later time. Uh, Paper-based testing will be phased out. So the last project that we're working on is the largest of all of them and kind of impacts the other two projects. Um, so CNT or certification and training rule. So in 1974, as most of you probably know, um, EPA published the first certification and training rule at the federal level under 40 CFR 171. Um, it granted authority 
to each state to use that rule as a basis for our requirements and establish their own set of state rules that kind of met their own needs. Um, Washington State's first CNT state plan was uh, approved by EPA in 1976, and EPA made no updates since then until 2017. So as you can imagine, there are a lot of change changes over the years with all the states kind of going their separate ways. But EPA, um, Washington State was in a good position as our CNT program was pretty strong already. Um, can we go to the next slide, Sana? So the CNT changes um, are pretty significant, um, even though Washington State has um, already met a lot of the other changes in place. So one of the biggest changes that we accomplished through uh, Senate Bill 5330 last session was increasing the minimum age for private applicators from 16 to 18, and that's a federal requirement. Um, we added definitions for direct supervision, supervision, or I'm sorry, revised the definition for direct supervision and added new new ones, um, added the ability to revoke a license that was issued based on a reciprocal license. Um, so if, for example, um, the individual got their license based on a reciprocal from Oregon State and their Oregon State uh, license was suspended, we could revoke or suspend it based on just on that. The biggest pieces are enhanced competency standards and changes to license categories. Um, so this means that uh, EPA kind of further defined what standards our licensees need to meet to obtain or maintain their license. Um, license categories will be changed. We'll be, be reducing from 31 categories to 26. Um, lots of uh, categories will be merged, eliminated, and adding new ones. Um, EPA also outlined direct supervision of non-certified applicators. So it outlines responsibilities for non-certified applicators as well as the licensed individuals supervising them um, and laying out training and safety requirements that must be met. And there's also a few changes for dealer record keeping as well. So what I added here is a QR code. Hopefully this works for you. Um, we, My staff did create uh, recorded webinars that goes over each of these requirements and changes that we'll be looking at over the coming years. Um, and so it's, you're free to take a look at that. Um, it's pretty in depth and um, lays out all of the changes that, that all licensees will need to do. So I have to mention that every single licensee, except for the structural pest inspectors that do um, solely do real estate transactions will be impacted in some way and will need to do something to maintain their license going forward after these rule changes are in effect. So what does that entail? So can we go to the next slide? So we did complete statute changes for the CNT updates. Um, going forward, staff are working on exam and category changes to meet those requirements. We do need to reconfigure our database to accommodate those category changes, um, as well as require a specialty credit for existing licensees to maintain their license and WAC updates. So our administrative code under 16 to 28 will need to be updated. We did issue the CR 101 last year, and uh, we are now drafting the rule language uh, so we can move to the CR 102 step. Uh, but before the CR 102 step, um, we need to reach out to stakeholders. Uh, we've been attending recertification events to inform and educate folks about the changes coming up. But one of the biggest pieces is um, an assessment we need to do a more in-depth community engagement, which is we can go to the next slide. Savannah. Thank you. Thanks, Savannah. Um, so um, legislator, the le legislature passed the HEAL Act, Healthy Environment for All Act in 2021, and it seeks to eliminate environmental and health disparities for in certain communities. So part of this includes a requirement for an environmental 
justice assessment for any significant agency action, and which a rule change is. Um, this required step is very new for us um, in our program and I think for our division. Um, and the reason I'm talking about this here is uh, because this may be a good venue to seek input on how to effectively engage with the community. I don't know if other agencies are here that have already gone through this uh, process. Um, Besides a little cleanup, all of the changes that will be proposed for our rules have already been approved by EPA as part of our certification and training state plan. So most of it cannot be changed. This engagement effort would be primarily uh, to seek input on how we can lessen the impacts or, and concerns um, through other actions. Um, and so I'm just welcome any input or suggestions on how to move forward in that community engagement. So these are examples of questions um, we need to pose to those communities um, and help build uh, an understanding of how to help help them through this this change. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you. Thanks, Dina. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, That's okay. Thanks for hanging in there with us. <laughs> Next, we have Perry Beal. All right. Hello, everyone. There's a game I kind of like to play sometimes, and that is name that crop and name where it's at. Name that Harris, you can't play this game. <laughs> potatoes. potatoes. Uh, that's potatoes in Grand County. Uh, my name is Perry Beale, and I'm the manager of the Natural Resources and Ag Science Program, an acronym we use NRAS for short. It's just it pulls off the tongue a little better. And uh, I'm also a a co-owner of a, a fairly large dry land wheat and cattle ranch in, in southeastern Washington. Some of you know where that is. Point at Grant over here. Uh, and I'm a licensed applicator, so a lot of this kind of work is, is uh, very near and dear to me, uh, especially in the program I'm at. Uh, the, the science program uh, has a lot of components. Um, and I will um, I, you know, briefly talk about every, uh, some of these and uh, I'll let you know what's going on uh, in those programs. We've got a soil, soil health program, and, and, and I'll back up and say most of these programs actually support the registration of pesticides in some way or another. Uh, the soil health program uh, is fairly new for us in the last uh, oh, three or four years, and that accommodate and that includes. Uh, Western Soil Health Initiative, or WASHI, uh, Sustainable Farms and Fields, which is more of a grant program, and STAR, which is more of a um, incentive type marketing type program. Uh, also related to that is some uh, soil health work that uh, we're doing in the BSP, which is a voluntary stewardship program. And that's all run by Dr. Danny Gillardi. Um, we've got a groundwater monitoring program that is uh, run by uh, Jacqueline Hancock. Uh, surface water monitoring program for pesticides run by Abigail Nicholson. Uh, pesticide usage data collection, uh, which is a typical usage data collection run by Dr. Chris McCullough. Uh, crop mapping and GIS which is uh, led by Joel Dem Demery and uh, pesticide stewardship which is more about the improving water quality and watersheds um, run by Margaret Brennan and uh, endangered species, last but not least. And, and uh, this, I'm pretty much the lead on this uh, particular program, but, uh, but I wanna mention, this is why NRAS was formed in the first place, uh, over 20 years ago. Um, this is how long endangered species have been impacting agriculture in the state. So, um, uh, I was the very first hire for, for this program uh, back in 20, 2002. So uh, WASHI, or Washington Soil Health Initiative, is really a tri-agency collaboration between WSU, the State Conservation Commission, and WSDA. It's really about collecting the science and technical support 
support the practices and, and help growers improve soil health, uh, not only for economic uh, viability, but for but for improving water quality and everything else that goes with that. Um, STAR is a, a brand new program that Dr. Gilardi wrote a effective or, uh, successful decision package on uh, uh, a few years ago. And what this does is it brings a national program uh, into the state of Washington to, to promote voluntary conservation practices in, in agriculture. And, and it kind of gives like a, uh, it, it's kind of like bragging rights, but it, it gives a STAR rating. Um, and, and STAR stands for Saving Tomorrow's Agricultural Resources. But we're excited about this. Uh, this could come into play even in the endangered species uh, work as a conservation program. So uh, we're excited that what this could mean for uh, giving some of our producers a little bit of a, a, a edge in the marketplace too. Surface water monitoring for pesticides has been going on a long time. This starts in 2003. Uh, it's, it's changed over time. What we do is we go in and we collect samples from many of these watersheds in the state. And uh, if we don't find any problems, um, we actually move on. And it's really good to provide uh, Provide the data to support you know the good things that's going on in the pesticide world. Um, for instance, these red X's you see up here, those are places that we used to monitor, and, and those we don't need to do that anymore because you know there's it, we've just proven that there is nothing, no off no, nothing of concern being offsite movement of pesticides into into especially into surface water, and and that's a and that's a you know we're we're really looking when we're doing this work it's. It's related to salmon and habitat most of the time, uh, but also includes places like the Palouse watershed where, where there aren't salmon. That's a picture of Abigail Nicholson, a person that runs this program up on the top left. Sometimes the, the water can get fairly deep. And we have a new groundwater pesticide monitoring program. This is a program that uh, we were able to start because Jackie Hancock had a, a put in a successful dish, uh, decision package uh, uh, a couple of years ago to start this. And it's gonna build off uh, a lot of the work we did partnering with the Department of Health to, to, to monitor pesticides in, in community wells. And so we're now gonna move more into the residential areas and some of the rural areas. Uh, some of the first places we're going to go are uh, the Pasco, uh, just north of Pasco and Walla Walla Basin. So we're excited about that um, to collect more data to support the industry. Uh, as I use each data, uh, this is uh, uh, also important in the registration process because it gives a typical uh, usage um, uh, profile, I, I guess would be a good enough word for a summary of, of what's going on in the industry. So we'll have, we'll actually have meetings with growers or right or create a survey to, to really, to ask them, what, what are you using? Because we have, as Brent mentioned, 15,000 registered products, but not everybody's using all those products all the time. And when those things are re-registered, 100% of the, uh, you know, the, the worst case scenario is always considered when these when they do risk assessment, EPA does risk assessment for these products. So if we can show that a product is only used on maybe 30% of the acres, because realistically, we're not using it on everything. We, we rotate our products for resistance and all kinds of other reasons. So to be able to show what's really happening is really important when it comes to keeping these things uh, registered and uh, especially without additional restrictions that you know we're seeing a lot of that coming out in the ESA world right now so, so uh, that work has been going on a long time too and we provide all of this data to EPA for that risk assessment process um, crop mapping um, I started this program in 2002 um, Joel's done a great job with this now um, it's basically mapping in GIS every crop in every agricultural field in the state of Washington. And we 
we get that data refreshed um, every two or three years, depending on the basin. But it's uh, uh, and so we can show trends. We can we can we know the crops move around every year. A lot of annual crops rotate, but but typically uh, stay the same in a, in a basin in that amount of time. And so um, that's given us a really good uh, where when it comes to pesticide use and fertilizer applications. And so we can do spatial analysis and actually really mine down and find out how much product can be used in a, in a watershed. That's super important as well in the risk assessment process. And uh, pesticide stewardship program is something we just started uh, as well in, a, in the last year or two. And this is a approach that uh, uh, we're taking, we, have, we got a grant from EPA to, to do some, some pilot work and we're starting the Palouse watershed. And, and mainly because we, we've done some surface water monitoring there, we've got some baseline data to go, go with and, and, and we're going to take the approach of, of, of we know where we are and we're gonna go in and, and work one-on-one -on -one with, with uh, growers and, conserva and partner with the conservation district and really see if we can't move the needle when it comes to uh, uh, what's being detected in the surface water. And, uh, and if we can show a program like this being effective, this is something that can benefit us uh, a lot down the road and especially endangered species regulations. So we're excited about that. We, uh, you know, we've got a lot of work to do there. And of course, uh, endangered species. Got, got, just touched on this a little bit on this presentation, but uh, I'm a, a member of the national work group that uh, that really has uh, been active in this in this uh, arena. Um, met 25 times. We met with the EPA several times. Uh, one on one, just to really give some really good feedback on what how is it going to impact uh, us here, and, and how is it really going to impact agriculture? And you know, as, as you know, ESA has been this litigation-driven machine that started 22 years ago or whatever, and and and, right, and EPA is under this timeline to to make these things happen. There's um, they were they were going down the BE or biological evaluation and and ultimately the biological opinion process and it, it was moving so slow that it only looked at a handful of products in you know 15 20 years and that that, that wasn't cutting it for uh, meeting deadlines through the litigation and 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 these mega lawsuits have been happening that are creating these tight deadlines for pesticides to be re-registered. And, and to be honest, that, uh, you know, the alternative is vacating these registrations. We don't want them. So uh, you know, we're trying to assist EPA as much as we can in this process, but there's new, there's gonna be new labels and uh, it's all gonna come down to all this new process that they're getting forced to do through this litigation. And that's more, that's lumping, lumping the, uh, uh, the risk assessment process into strategies. You've heard about vulnerable species strategy where they lumped all the most vulnerable uh, endangered species and, and looked at, at uh, mitigations for that. Uh, we saw what that original draft was where pretty, pretty much couldn't apply any pesticide in Western Washington. It was, it was very, uh, it was a big deal. And, and then the herbicide strategy has come out. Um, so they lump all the herbicides together and do mitigations for that. And then we're soon to be in the ribenicide strategy and then soon to be fungicide and sex. So they're lumping these pesticides into these strategies to do, you know, lump mitigation strategies. And all these are going to end up showing up in, in these uh, supplemental labels. Um, and it's either going to be on the section three label or it's going to be in a, uh, in a bulletins, what we call bulletins live two. Um, and where the, when the label says you must go to this website, you have to go to it and uh, uh, obtain a bulletin if, if you're in an area that, that has a pesticide use limitation area. Um, the map you see here is that uh, all the squiggly lines in Washington is sediment, mostly. 
And that's because the National Marine Fishery Service is the only one that have put in pools. Soon, uh, you know, Fish and Wildlife is going to be adding all kinds of, of, of the, like for the herbicide strategy and all these other strategies. There's going to be pretty much the whole state's going to be, be covered, right, with, with these pesticide use limitation areas. So something you need to be aware of, something that's coming at us, um, something we need to watch for on the label. Right now, there's only a handful of products that you see that are in, in, in this. So more to come. All of our education outreach that Scott's group's doing, everybody, uh, Wendy Sue's group, everybody's, it's like all hands on deck now to bring everybody up to speed on this stuff. And this pretty good picture is from my, I picked, off, picked that off the back of a horse in the bottom of the river bluffs where I send my cows in the summertime. But, we spray a lot of noxious weeds in that kind of country, and some by helicopter, some by uh, side by side, some by backpack, all of the above. So, so it's not just cross country. That's all I got. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks, Perry. Um, all right, so we're going to pause right now and just take any questions from any of the WSDA program managers. Um, so do we have any in the chat? None, none in the chat. OK. Um, any in? We have, a, we have a comment in the chat that just says the PSD um, work is exciting. It's a very successful program in Oregon, relying on local voluntary engagement to prioritize and innovate. Um, I know Christina had some questions for the group during her presentation about the environmental justice and community engagement. So kind of to elicit some comments from that. So maybe if there are no questions, if there's any time we can add to that. Uh, food will be here around noon. It'll show up there and, I, and I'll be hoping to get that in. Um, and then we'll have a break until 12.30. So we've got some time for questions. Yeah, any in-person questions? Or comments for Tina? She might like that. <laughs> nope, no questions or comments. All right, well, um, we'll just... We're going to pause and take our break and we'll come back at 1230. Yes. Yes. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't say earlier when I was speaking, but, uh, you know, there's been times in the past when folks like us in the pesticide programs weren't real uh, fond of the Department of Agriculture. And there was a real rift between us. And uh, that right now, I think it's the best relationship that I've ever seen with advocators and folks in the industry with the Department of Agriculture. And you got some good folks here. So work on those relationships and, and bring that stuff forward. That's really, really important that we do that. And, uh, you know, people change. Uh, you know, and, and directors change and these things happen, but if we maintain good relationships with everybody in there, that also goes a long ways towards moving this forward in a positive way. So just wanted to bring that up because I'm really, yeah, I'm pretty proud of the group that we got in Department of Ag right now, and they're all willing to work and do things together. So build on that. Except for this guy here is a little shaky, but everybody. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks. All right, there's nothing else, then we will break for lunch and be back at 12.30.
and not request. Hello, everyone. We're going to get started again. So, you can take a seat. We're going to have DOH start with presentation. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm yeah, <laughs> from the Department of Health um, out of the Office of Environmental Public Health Sciences. And uh, today it'll be myself, Griselda Arias. I'm the program manager for the Acute Pesticide Illness Surveillance and Prevention Program. I will be sharing this time with Eleanor Fanning, who is a toxicologist um, out of the Office of Environmental Public Health Sciences. Um, for our brief little presentation, we're hoping uh, to help you understand the workings of the Acute Pesticide Illness Surveillance and Prevention Program and learn about other areas where DOH may interact in the world of pesticides. Uh, first off, the Acute Pesticide Pro Illness uh, and Prevention Program, what we do, we investigate reports of uh, pesticide caused illnesses. These reports come from the Poison Center, they come from labor and industries, from the Department of Ag, and directly from uh, suppliers or individuals. Uh, listed are the authorities that um, Chapter 70.104 and the notifiable conditions WAC, that gives us the authority to perform these investigations. A suspected or confirmed pesticide poisoning is a notifiable condition in the state of Washington. And I just wanted to do a note of passive surveillance. So passive surveillance in public health refers to the system in which healthcare providers and other reporting entities voluntarily submit information or reports about specific health conditions or diseases to public health. So we only investigate things that come to us. We are not um, out as WSDA does, you know, driving around noticing applications or anything like that. Um, a little just kind of, you, you've heard from WSDA, you've heard about FIFRA. Um, I've got a few of their WACs and their chapters, and then the R chapter and WAC, and then also Washington uh, State Labor and Industries. And then the three of us have a memorandum of understanding when it comes to the investigation of human exposures, because we all touch that in certain, in, in any, in a certain way, we may all be investigating one case or Two of us may be investigating one case. That could be WSDA and DOH. That could be WSDA and LNI. That could be in any combination. And so what this memorandum of understanding does is it lays out what, uh, who is the lead in an investigation and kind of where our scope is. Um, and then this is a, another diagram to illustrate. So we get reports from various areas. We investigate these. Uh, these reports and then our findings are used to inform action to prevent these from happening. We share data with uh, regulators, with local and public health. Uh, we try to apply these fi findings to educate healthcare providers, workers, the public. We also partner with the EPA, um, higher education, and we submit our data to NIOSH and the CDC. Um, and this uh, slide that we, uh, one of my investigators, Henry, recently created for a joint WSDA staff meeting was to illustrate the structure of our program and the structure of how we classify cases. So at the very top, you've got the CDC. So you've got the Center for Disease Control and Prevention's National Notifiable Disease Surveillance System. Underneath that, you've got the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. 
And underneath that, you have the Pesticide Illness and Injury Surveillance Program. And underneath that is the Sentinel Event Notification System for Occupational Risk Program, which is Sensor. That is the program that we follow when it comes to classifying a case and calling something a case, defining something as, yes, this pesticide caused this illness. Um, and this, and it's done on a classification criteria. So we classify based on three things, the exposure, the health effect, and then the causal relationship between the pesticide and the uh, health effect. And it's based on a numbering. So clearly there has to be an exposure, there has to have been health effects reported, and there has to be toxicological information that can um, create that causal relationship for us to say that it is, it is either definite that this happened, it is probable, and it is no or possible. And when we uh, report out information, we only report out the definite, probable, and possible. Now, a possible case does not mean that it is any less of a case than a definite. It means we had varying levels of evidence, and that is what, but it is still a case. And all of our data is publicly available. So we've got data on our cases um, on the Washington Tack Tracking Network, and we also have a pesticide illness uh, data and reports dashboard that you can go in and manipulate and look at certain areas or certain years or certain crops. Um, and it is updated every year with all of our uh, data. And up here, this is just a slide with all of uh, the whole team, which is myself. And then we have three investigators from the state of Washington. Um, we have a data, data compiler and medical records request coordinator, Ida. And then we have a part-time epidemiologist, uh, Daniel Parker. And that is the Acute Pesticide Illness and Surveillance Prevention Program. The last thing I wanted to touch on uh, that DOH does is I do staff the Pesticide Application Safety Committee. Um, this was created uh, back in 2019. Uh, it does expire July of 2025. <coughs> it is, uh, the purpose of this committee is to develop recommendations toward improving safety of pesticide applications. I've got the website link there. The next meeting of this committee will be April 19th in Olympia. I will be posting all of that information on this uh, website. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Eleanor to talk about a little bit more about the consultation side of uh, DOH. Great. And, okay. Thank you, you figured something. Hi, so I'm Eleanor Fanning and I'm a toxicologist at the Department of Health. So I sit in a little bit different part of the agencies and Griselda does. Um, I'm in the Office of Environmental Public Health Sciences, and um, so we wanted to really focus on Griselda's program because the pesticide illness investigation is kind of the core of what DOH does around pesticides, but we also want to kind of tell you some of the areas where we have provided consult or are available for consult on pesticide-related issues. Um, and so we just pulled a couple of these out. So um, <clears throat> on A there, that uh, recently there was an EPA framework proposed and they were asking for input on pesticides that can create antimicrobial resistance. So uh, WASA reached out and brought us in to, to, com to a comment letter. So that's an example of how we might work together. Um, an area that we've been certainly involved in are some of the Department of Ag programs to eradicate invasive species, where we might get tapped to help provide that public health information. We would run, um, we would run a, basically a toxicological and human health review on the ingredient list of whatever agent is being applied. So Japanese beetle is a great example here with the acelaprin um, campaign. And so one of the toxicologists on my team helped review the formulations and create some of the content for WASDA's fact sheet about potential public health impacts. In the case of the celebrant, it's really not a mammalian health risk. 
So it helps to have the Department of Health kind of there putting that content out. And Mallory Little has also been on, you know, on some of the public communication panels. So we can really help with those risk communication situations around pub public health where pesticides are involved. So yes, fungi moth, uh, Japanese beetle. Um, <clears throat> of course, one of our primary consult goals as toxicologists is to Brazil this program. So that's an internal DOH consult that we provide where if they have a case that's, you know, got some complexity or they just need that deeper dive with toxicological experience, then they will call on us for a consult. A um, couple of other areas that I thought of that came up, um, aquatic vegetation control programs that might be with Department of Ecology, it could be a county, and sometimes those can be in residential areas and people start asking questions. And so then the Department of Health can be brought in to help facilitate that conversation about, you know, public health concerns. So that's something that yeah, I'm thinking about. There was a rope known situation. I think we have a colleague working in Thurston County on something right now. Um, and maybe this would also, it's a little different, but I'm thinking about the, um, Carbaryl and oyster beds uh, for the for the for the little shrimps. I know I know my colleague Barb Morrissey was involved in some of that risk management and communication work. Um, so then I want to I, you know I thought uh, one of my colleagues runs site assessment program and they do a lot of work on you know where orchard land has you know, maybe gone out of agricultural use, but there's legacy lead arsenate. And so kind of, it, you know, it's a little peripheral to what we're talking about on this committee, but sometimes you have situations where there's a public health concern about land use. And so we would do risk assessments on those situations and provide um, education. And one of those actually we got called uh, in for one of the cannabis uh, up in the Okanagan where there was some legacy DDT and DDE. And so health had to do an assessment to say, you know, are consumers at risk? So that's an example. Um, quickly, because I know we got a little late start so we're running short on time. Um, one of our few mandated areas, those consult areas are not necessarily in the RCWs. That's like, you know, we encourage interagency collaboration on those areas. But drinking water, we do have uh, primacy with the EPA there. And so we have authority to um, enforce compliance under the Federal Safe Drinking Water Act. And of course, some pesticidal uh, ingredients um, are of concern in groundwater. So we won't go on too much with that, but I think there are opportunities for collaboration there. <coughs> Actually, going back, I think we did uh, work on the DAC call in groundwater issues. <coughs> Quickly, a couple of IPM activities in the state where DOH staffs um, and kind of helps promote some of those practices. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through these, but the um, what used to be the Registration Commission, now that whatever it is, Washington Commission on IPN, um, Griselda, and staff that, along with other folks in the room, I'm sure. So, um, Last thing is, and Griselda mentioned this, but our epidemiologists, our spatial epidemiologists maintain the Washington Tracking Network map. And that is a geospatial tool for public communication. And when we do have pesticide illness events or drinking water detections, they're gonna get mapped onto that tool that has a lot of other environmental health information in it. Um, and that's just for that public communication. A couple of other areas that I'd love to touch on, but we don't have time today. And I just really look forward to working with this group. And I hope that 
by participating in this board, we we really help pull, you know, grow those interagency efforts and opportunities for collaboration and kind of cross discussion. So thank you very much. And we have like two minutes for questions oh. if there are any you want to elaborate. But yeah, so if there's any quest time for questions, two minutes. Any questions? Um it's uh, on the uh, sensors uh, classification of uh, possible probable illness. Are any uh, pharmacokinetic um, <coughs> considerations taken in this classification? I give you an example of what I'm talking about. Okay, yeah. So uh, I've been involved or asked to my opinion uh, about uh, say exposure the uh, aerial application to something like Lambda Sahelithra. We have workers within literally seconds to minutes are claiming that they're sick. But if you read the pharmacokinetic literature on um, these compounds, by uh over a 24-hour period, you're lucky at 2% to make it through your stratopodia into your dermis, your blood vessels, by your capillaries on. So how is it possible that you can call something like that probable when the pharmacokinetics don't match that particular situation? Well, you're assuming I would call something like that probable. You're assuming I don't have uh, medical information. I have, I would, someone simply saying they're sick is not sufficient. Well, that, well that, 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 that's my, I'll give you the example. Yeah. Of that, what would you consider pharmacokinetics as being relevant to making that decision? So it would have to be, it's in the toxicology of the product. Like if, the, if there is, if that product really, there is no way that that product that could have caused those symptoms in those seconds, as you say, then we wouldn't be able to classify that case because the toxicology information tells us otherwise. So the answer is yes. Yes, you do. Yes, yes. That's what I wanted to know. Yes. <laughs> the answer is yes. And if it were a complicated one, that is a great That's example a, yeah. where the result of what her investigator would come to us in the toxicology unit and say, hey, take a look. And then we would dive into the into more of those technical details and look at exactly issues like that. And we had one recently with the dermal exposure right. and mm -hmm. symptoms and it the you know, it just I didn't map out it's kind of letters i'm, I'm yeah. happy to do that I yeah do, I, so know you know me. we we do try to provide that that kind of technical um guidance when it's an issue that the investigators need that support on okay great That's yeah thank you any other questions for us at Hulse? and i don't see any in the chat either unless i'm missing um i don't see any on here, but there's no question. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Looks like Ellen I is up. Sorry. <laughs> we did have a question from Luizio. Sorry, he said we would like to increase our TSCDs program collaborating with DOH. How do we go about it? So maybe connect with Celia. Yeah, let's yes. start with a conversation and, and we will figure out how to do that. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Ophelia. All right. Um, how's everyone feeling after lunch? We get a temperature check. We doing good? Was the food okay? Are we happy? Um, I hope the people that joined us virtually had a wonderful lunch. I, I am sure that it pales in comparison to the lunch that was provided here. But it's so wonderful to see so many of you here in person. And also um, a big thanks to everyone that's joining us virtually. It's been really nice to be able to connect with a lot of familiar faces today. But also, uh, I'm really excited for the opportunity to connect with new people. So my name is Bradley Ferrar. I work for the Washington State Department of Labor and Industries, um, commonly called L&I. Um, and I'm, I'm the non-voting member. Um, on the Pesticide Advisory Board, uh, representing the Director of Labor and Industries. And then um, we also have Craig Blackwood, the Assistant Director of the um, Division of Occupational Safety and Health, who is a voting member. But we're, we're thrilled to be able to have these conversations regarding pesticides. And today I just wanted to give a, a real high level overview of what Labor and Industries does. I, I think a lot of people have heard of Labor and Industries, um, but not everyone might be aware of everything we do. So 
Labor and Industries, um, our mission is to keep Washington safe and working. Um, we have we have over 3,000 employees based in over 19 regional offices throughout the state, um, and we have a lot of different divisions within labor and industries. Um, so, you know, one of our goals is protecting the safety and health of workers. So that falls on the division of occupational safety and health. And I'll talk more about DOSH here in a little bit. Um, but then we also provide workers' compensation insurance. So if a worker is injured on the job, we ensure that they're, that they're able to heal from that injury, that they're provided with medical treatment, and, and that they're given all the tools and resources necessary to be able to get back to work. We have some programs such as you know, early return to work and return to work programs that can help um, help workers get back to, to work and helping um, helping the organizations that they work for sooner rather than later. Um, we also we also protect workers' wages the breaks, lunch hours, all that fun stuff. Um, and that's done through our Fraud Prevention and Labor Standards Unit division. Um, so, you know, things like minimum wage, um, overtime, if it's applicable, um, making sure that people have breaks and, um, and the, you know, those breaks are paid for. All of that is, is part of what labor and industries does. Then we also do a, a variety of other things such as, inspecting elevators. I'm sure if any of you have hopped in an elevator lately, you may have seen a little certificate um, issued by the Department of Labor and Industries. We also license plumbers and electricians. We basically um, help protect homeowners and business owners from, um, you know, from unsafe work and economical hardship you know, in, through licensing of um, contractors and other, and other methods. Yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about safety and health here in Washington. Um, you know, we have a really rich history of safety and health here in Washington state. Our original constitution mentions, um, mentioned safety and health. It's the only constitution of all of the states that mentioned uh, workplace safety. Um, and we've had workplace safety and health rules in effect since 1923. Um, so a lot longer than federal OSHA. Um, so we have a rich history here in Washington State of protecting workers. Um, in 1973, the um, as part of you know reacting or or pivoting to the federal Occupational Safety and Health Act, um, Washington implemented the the Industrial Safety and Health Act. Um, and as part of that, we we signed on to be what's referred to as a state plan state. So similar to how WSDA has oversight from EPA to help drive their programs, and even Department of Health has oversight from EPA on, on different programs. We have oversight from federal OSHA, um, but we're here in Washington State. We're able to. We have to be at least as protective as federal OSHA. But in many ways, we go above and beyond what federal OSHA requires. And one great example of that is agriculture. We offer far more protections to agricultural workers here in Washington state than federal OSHA offers to, um, to agricultural workers. So um, some states that have similar plans are California and Oregon. Um, so talking a little bit about the DOSH primary programs. We have a compliance unit, um, similar to the unit that, um, that Scott Nelson has um, with WSDA. They go out and they, they look for hazards in the workplace. They make sure that workers are kept safe and they help ensure that, um, that business owners are you know, addressing the hazards in the workplace. Some of the um, sub elements of compliance, we have discrimination. Um, so if, there, if there's retaliation, for you know, it, workers exercising their rights to report a safety concern or to file a complaint. Um, we have resources available to help individuals. And there's also an appeals process um, because you know, it's, important, it's important for, um, you know, as you go through the um, compliance process, it's important for, for business owners to exercise their rights and to have an opportunity to, to you know, they, they, Argue, argue against findings um, and explain, explain situations. So we have appeals. Uh, we also offer 
a no cost or no fee safety consultation for employers. So they go and do the same work that the compliance staff will do, but it's only at the request of an employer. There's no cost associated with that and they won't impose fines. So, and then they'll help you build your safety program through, you know, they'll help you build an accident prevention program. They'll help you recognize, um, identify and, and fix hazards in the workplace, you know, all, all in the spirit of collaboration. Um, we also have an education and outreach program and I'm part of that education and outreach program. So we develop a lot of materials and we disseminate information on safety and health rules to help employers um, comply with rules and to fix well, most importantly, to fix hazards in the workplace, give them the tools, because we know that employers are very busy. So we want to we want to try to provide them with the tool, all the tools possible to be able to eliminate hazards in the workplace. Um, we also, you know, similar to WSDA, we have um, we have a program specific to agricultural workers, where we do a, a hands-on, interactive, ten-hour training. Um, addressing safety and health in the agricultural workplace. We have bilingual, um, a bilingual crew that does that. We also have a training of training programs so that individuals can get trained to provide that training um, for their workplaces or to, to others, um, because we realize that it is, it takes a group effort to really create a, a culture, a safety culture, it's a group effort. It takes buy-in from businesses. It takes buy-in from labor and employees, and it takes buy-in from all of us um, to really create an effective safety culture in the workplace. Uh, we also have a standards and technical policy group, and they're in charge of rulemaking, um, giving interpretations of rules and things of that nature. Um, and we are extremely fortunate here in Washington State to have incredible leadership. Um, and right here in the room, we have our assistant director, Craig Blackwood. Um, and he's even wearing a tie today. That doesn't happen all the time. Um, but um, you know, his, his goal, like all of ours, is to, is to make sure that workplaces are free from known and recognized hazards and to ensure that uh, workers are able to go home in the same condition um, that they showed up to work in. So talking a little bit about LNI and pesticide regulation, um, WSDA and DOH have, have touched pretty, pretty drastically, or um, well, not drastically, but they've, they've touched already on the different elements where we collaborate. And we do do a lot of collaboration, not only with sister agencies, but also with other, with other entities. Um, but you know, basically, LNI and pesticides, we're looking at the workplace. We're making sure that anywhere that pesticides are used, that workers are not exposed to a hazard. To kind of illustrate this, um, yesterday I left left my home in Olympia to come over here. As I as I left um, as I left my home, off to the off to the side on the on the grass, there's a little little sticker that showed me that um, that there was a pesticide application that had taken place. It's like okay, well there's one way we would make sure that those people that are spraying that are applying those pesticides are safe. Um, and you do it, you know, <clears throat> applying those pesticides according to the label. As I continue driving, getting into um, Yakima, you see the orchards, see a lot of, um, you'd see the, you'd see the remnants of applications. You'd also see mixing and loading sites. Driving down the interstate, I passed the self, a self-driving John Deere sprayer. I think it's a 600 series sprayer. Further down, past Sensky Pest um, Services. Got to the hotel, you can see the rodent traps outside. All of those are places where workers have applied pesticides or handling pesticides. So we want to make sure that they're doing it properly and that they're doing it safely, that they're given the information on how to properly um, utilize pesticides. And um, you know, again, the coordination with other agencies and also with the universities, Washington State University, Potato Commission, like endless um, organizations, the Washington State Tree Fruit Association. There are so many, and we really value those partnerships, and we want to work together with all of you to help keep Washington safe and working. Some ways to stay connected with LNI. Um, if you scan that QR code, you'll be able to sign up for email updates where you'll be able to keep up to date with everything that's happening in labor and industries. 
Also, if you have interest in a no-cost consultation, really, really urge you to take advantage of this wonderful service. And if you have any questions, if you have any areas for collaboration, uh, reach out to us. We'd love to, we'd love to work together with you all. And thank you all so much for your time. Thank you, Bradley. We have some time for questions. I've got a few minutes. I could talk a little longer than that. Are there any questions? Is the uh, colon estrace monitoring program still going on, or is that uh, the fault? Uh, the, the colon estrace monitoring program is still going on. Um, I believe currently we have. We, we don't have as many um, employers taking advantage of some of the some of the offerings that we have with the colon estrace monitoring program. Um, but we are happy to happy to discuss that more with you and share any information if you if you have um, questions on that or even just talking about the well, the use of those kinds of insecticides has really crashed. <laughs> yeah, and you can tell just by the food residue databases, you find very few opiates on food. Yeah, yeah. Well, you see the pesticides that are used, they, they change a lot. Um, you know, we've seen more regulations regarding a lot of a lot of um, pesticides. And you know, we'll we'll continue offering that program as long as it's it, it makes sense and that there's a need for it. Um, but yeah, it's it's nice to see how how things evolve and you know we're constantly improving on our methods of applying pesticides and you know that focus on integrated pest management is important. Pesticides are important tools, but we want to make sure that workers are using them properly. Um, Ophelio has the same question. Um, how can they go about collaborating with you all more? Yeah, well, great question. Um, we do have, we have collaborated with Ophelio's group in the past, and it's been, we, we appreciate that collaboration, and uh, there's always opportunity for, for further collaboration. So Ophelio, reach out to me directly. I'd uh, love, to, love to brainstorm some ideas on further ways that our groups can, can collaborate, and that goes the same for anyone. If you have an idea, if you want to collaborate, if you need help, reach out to us. Uh, we even have safety and health investment program grants. We have money available for you to develop resources specific to, to your workplaces, to, to, to different industries. So you know, reach out to us. We, we have a lot of tools available to, to help. You know, we, we have a compliance unit for sure. Sometimes it shows up in the news and the work that they do is vitally important. I appreciate the work that compliance does but we have a whole support system behind that to help employers avoid ever having to deal with the compliance um, team. Thank you. I don't see any more questions. So thank you so much. My pleasure. <laughs> All right, so when I decided to be to apply for the position of director of the Pesticide Resources and Education Program, I made myself a goal before I even applied, and that was to on track to reach more people. So that's what drives my program, what drives our program at WSU. So before I talk about what we do, I want to talk about the core of pesticide safety education and that it's not just here in Washington State, but there are us across the entire United States. So federal pesticide regulations require each state to provide certification and training for licensed applicators for use of restricted use pesticides. And it was established nationwide that each land grant university, so WSU being a land grant university, um, is put into support and certification training efforts for the US Environmental Protection Agency. And this is mandated by FIFRA, so Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Organicide Act, which is a law. So PSEPs, as we're called, um, create synergies with networks of other land grant universities. We collaborate together, we use each other's information and we spread it across our states. We use, work with state regulatory agencies. We had a wonderful working relationship with WSDA along with um, LNI, Department of Health, all of those. So we take those complicated concepts, controversial subjects, uh, inaccurate messaging, and we put on trainings and 
So pesticide safety education is to protect human health and the environment, that's the mandate from EPA to WSDA. So PSEPs partner with state, federal regula regulatory uh, regulators to educate on safe and legal handling of pesticides. So here in Washington state, we serve a wide diversity of stakeholders. I'm out there to reach anybody that I can possibly. And program is tailored for our state's diverse clientele. So there's all kinds of people that come to our trainings. I include growers, the green industries, pest management professionals, a lot of um, state workers come to our trainings. So our inputs were about 75% self-funded. So what brings it, we bring into our program, we have 22% for VISO and about 3% for grants and that's steady over the years. We do pesticide safety education. We do it online, we do it uh, webinars, we do it face-to-face -face, and we do internet courses. We also provide uh, pr produce study materials for people who are taking their license exams. We have the PICO, we manage the Pesticide Information Center online database, about 25,000 labels, and that is including labels that were registered in Oregon and in Washington. We have a publication review position where any, anything that comes through WSU that talks about pesticides, we review it to make sure that there's, they're, they're following the laws, rules, and labels. And then we've also recently, uh, about a year and a half ago, started a Spanish training. We were approached by Department of Agriculture to start addressing some issues with Spanish for the landscape. And we have stepped up to do that. We had a professor at w in entomology that stepped in to help us with that. So it's very exciting to be a part of that. We're housed in the entomology department. We have full support of our chair. She is great and right on, has her finger on the pulse of what's going on. And all the stars here represent how many new people I onboarded last year. So it's been quite the, quite the right. Great team. I'm really excited. Nolan Oxen from our team is in the in the audience today. So in Pickle, Pickle is a, uh, for people who don't know about it, it's a free searchable database to the open to the public where all the labels from Washington State and Oregon are put in and you have information about you could search that database for you're going to look for corn maggots what what pests I can use on corn maggots on corn you can search that site you can search that pest and pull up those labels and this is a critical time for that because we have the ESA so okay you know, look at that label before you even purchase the product, make sure is there ESA language on there? Can you meet those mitigation measures? We also have that PSI recommendations. So all of these, this is just examples of all the different things that we do PSI uh, reviews on. And about 5,000 recommendations a year, five to 6,000 that our reviewer goes through. And that reviews about 12, about 1,200 labels. Of course, some of them are duplicative, you know, you see Clive State over and over and over again, but unique labels that they look at over 1,200. That's a lot, that's a lot of reading. <laughs> Amazing. So our course registration for pesticide safety education, this shows unique individuals. We have people that come to our classes again and again, so that number can be five to 600, but when you pull it down to the unique individuals that we're touching for about 3,300, we have our internet courses, about 7,677, not about, that's how many <laughs> were completed last year, where people can go on, take those courses and get credit for their pesticide, to keep their pesticide license current so they don't have to go through that testing again, because many people don't like that testing. <laughs> <laughs> Study materials sell about 7,800 a year. Uh, on an average, and that number just keeps going up. There's a lot of people out there that want to become licensed applicators. So the people, the outputs, people are reach, reach about 19,000 people with the program. Um, it, the program used to be pesticide safety education and resources, two separate programs strong for 30 years. They were merged about two years ago to become one program to kind of share some resources. And obviously we have common goals. Impact, I'd like to talk about that. So one thing that our, we provide pre-licensed trainings where the people can come in and take our class and then go and take their exam. And we find that coming to the class, they obviously, because we're kind of spit shining before they go into the, to the exam, um, there's higher pass rate for people who come to our courses. So this data is from 2002. So 72% 
pass with 28% fail after coming to a course as opposed to coming off the street, 52 pass with 48 fail. Uh, the 23 data we're still putting together, but what's exciting about 23 is we brought in hands-on for pre-licensed training. So people are picking up a label and they're reading it and they're putting on personal protective equipment and they're highlighting the different parts of the label that are important. And we definitely see an increase in passing rates for the, and that's focused on the laws and safety <coughs> exam. So that's bumped up from 82 to, or 72 to 80 something. I can't remember exactly what it was, but very excited to see that that hands-on component that we're bringing on is making even a bigger difference. <clears throat> I'm really working on trying to assess the needs of what's out there. Who needs us to come and talk? What are the needs? What are the resource needs for the different people? So these are some of the people that I focused on in the past. I'm constantly looking to see what kind of connections I can make and collaborations. I'm like, I believe in what Ophelio is doing and other people are doing with the collaborations. Very important. This is what our focus is right now, but I highlighted the things that we're doing in conjunction with the Washington State Department of Agriculture. So uh, with ESA, we helped them work on the um, presentations that were put together. We took it to field days last summer where, uh, where people were out looking at crops and the, what was effective on crops. We had someone go out to as many as we possibly could physically go to and talk about ESA. Um, our study manuals were updating with the changes for testing and also the CNT changes. So working directly with Washington State Department of Agriculture and Christina Zimmerman's awesome team with that. The, for the Spanish language manuals, we've had some discrepancies that we're working with uh, with Washington State Department of Agriculture for cohesion of, of their exams and more with our manuals. And our Spanish language, WSDA has been foundational in helping us build that program and working with our team members on that. So well, that is it. That's my my program in a nutshell. <laughs> Any questions? Yes, sir. Um, uh, how long is the uh, pretest? Is it a semester? Or oh, that's a good question. So we had I had a question from the back here. The pre license test, or the pre license course is a day and a half. So we expect that people have looked at the study manuals by the time they come in. We help them not only just on the content but taking an exam, you know, taking that bubble exam that you took in elementary school can be challenging for people. So we give them opportunities. Um, and I like to also point out that last year, Dawn was helping somebody with a, with a question and they were using a calculator and they said, this isn't working out, what's going on? And they were trying to do a uh, division. division and they were using the percentage sign because people don't use calculators anymore, they use their phones. Yes. So now Dawn's incorporated into our classes using that calculator, putting it in their hands. So. Rough cost? Our, our courses are face-to-face uh, -face are $60 per day for a two-day course, depending on what you need. So 120, that, that comes out to $10, a, $10 an hour roughly. Yeah, great question. What other questions can I answer? I know you guys aren't shy. Any questions from online? <laughs> None in the chat, but you do have a couple minutes. So, anyone has questions? Yes. So, I don't really have a question, just a, a comment and an expression of gratitude. Uh, this past year, Wendy Sue Wheeler and her team invited us to, um, to be a part of their recertification. Um, series. They gave us time to talk about common hazards that we encounter in workplaces related to pesticides. And we really value that, uh, that opportunity and that collaboration. And I'm just really impressed with, um, with the overall team and the, the caliber of trainings and just how committed they are. So just a, a thank you and looking forward to continuing uh, collaborating. We've had great input or uh, feedback from the LNI presentation. So, yes. Well, um, in the Spanish uh, speakers, um, besides the language barrier, barrier, what what would you consider another skill that they're lacking, or that they, you know, somebody can work on with them before coming? So we we're in the process of assessing what what all of that would do, and we rely heavily on Ophelio because his group has has worked. Um, I believe with the, the uh, Spanish speaking community. But we thought one of the biggest, there's many roadblocks for them taking the exams. One of them being that the 
label itself is in English, and uh, but they can take some of the exams in Spanish. So helping them try to find where on the label or important information for, you know, as, as an applicator. There is a, the, another thing that our program is working on across the United States is they're looking at common language. The, so the language of what they may read is very challenging because of the, of the different dialects. So there is a national, um, national committee that came together. It's from the American Association of Pesticide Safety Education. Uh, safety educators, and they're trying to find that common language that they can use across the United States. Very challenging, but at least to, to try to come together so we're all unified in helping the best that we can. Thank you. We just have one more question in the chat and then we'll go on to the next presentation. So Casey says, thanks for the overview. Wendy Sue's team is so productive and highly regarded mm -hmm. nationally. Great to see your new initiatives in Spanish and in ESA implementation. Thank you, Casey. <laughs> yeah, I was All right, so we have Marie Hallinan. Um, Marie, would you like to unmute? Uh, you could also share your screen if you'd like, or I can advance the slides for you. Hi, uh, yeah, you can advance my slides. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yes. All right, awesome. Um, so hi, everyone. Um, thanks for the invite again to this group. Um, I'll do a brief introduction and then kind of overview of what regional EPA does and a little bit about um, kind of federal pesticide rules as well. So um, about me, um, Marie Hallinan, I, I'm here with EPA Region 10. I'm a FIFRA Enforcement and Program Specialist here. Um, I've been with EPA for about two and a half years now. Um, I'm the project officer for Washington State, um, which means that uh, I handle some of the grant stuff, the cooperative agreement that we have with the Washington State Department of Ag. Um, I'm also a regional integrated pest management and pollinator protection coordinator as well. So I do some work around that. Um, I have a degree in forest entomology from the University of Minnesota. So I'm originally an entomologist. I'm also a returned Peace Corps volunteer um, having served in Senegal. Uh, next slide. So uh, this is EPA region 10. There's actually 10 uh, EPA regions in the United States. Um, our region includes Alaska, Idaho, Oregon, Washington, as well as 271 native tribes. Um, so we have our regional offices kind of headquartered uh, in Seattle, but we also have offices in each state. Um, we have an uh, office in Anchorage, Alaska, Boise, Idaho. We have a few more offices in Washington, um, as well as an office in Portland, Oregon. And we have our laboratory in Manchester, Washington. So um, our pesticide team consists of eight people. Six of us are in Seattle, two in Boise. Um, that team includes inspectors, enforcement officers, project officers, and scientists. Uh, next slide. So what exactly do we do with, at the regional level of EPA? Uh, so we have oversight of that FIFRA cooperative agreement with our region 10 states. So that's basically a big grant um, for the pesticide programs. Um, we provide technical assistance to the states as well. Um, we're responsible for federal pesticide applicator licensing, and we also enforce pesticide law on tribal reservations. So that includes pesticide producing establishments and use inspections on tribal reservations as well. Um, we also do Section 7 production reporting, which is something that um, pesticide uh, producing establishments have to do annually, as well as imports inspections. So in the photo, you can see uh, Bethany Plu on the very right there is out doing uh, some worker inspection, or worker protection standard inspection um, out in the field. Uh, next slide. So a day in the life for me might look something like this. Um, I'm going to have uh, some management of the cooperative agreement with Washington State Department of Ag, so that might look be looking over the budget and uh, so the program or administrative elements. Um, I might be taking a call from a member of the public <laughs> who might have uh, some, some concerns or questions about either EPA, uh, maybe they, they saw a pesticide application happen that they're concerned about. Um, I get calls about pest issues, maybe questions about bed bugs, uh, ticks, that sort of thing. 
um, that I'll respond to and provide some information. I also do some public outreach. Um, we're currently this year partnering with um, Seattle uh, Parks and Recreation to do some outreach, um, kind of cross program with state as well as EPA materials. Um, and I'm also going to do I, I, I do some enforcement work as well. Um, so I work with like our legal team. Um, and that might involve delving into FIFRA to kind of evaluate uh, maybe a pesticide use case, but more often it's going to be those pesticide producing establishments in our region. Uh, next slide. So EPA and state relationships, so state lead agencies and in Washington state, the Washington State Department of Ag is the state lead agency. And so they have what's called primacy to implement and enforce FIFRA. So um, basically that means that the state lead agency has responsibility to enforce on the ground, stuff like the worker protection standard. Um, they do a lot of the water quality work, um, endangered species work as well, um, certification and training, they do a lot. So there's cooperative agreements that EPA has with states that will detail exactly the work that's required. And that state program can be more rigorous or restrictive when it comes to pesticides than what's required under federal rules but not ever less restrictive. Um, so there's a certain standard that all state programs must meet nationally. So we do work together. EPA will assist the state as requested. We call that cooperative federalism or under extraordinary circumstances. Um, and I just had to emphasize here how much I appreciate everyone with Washington State Department of Ag um, and all the amazing work they do. Um, they make my job super easy because they're, they just are national experts basically. Um, and their program is is a national lead um, in a lot of ways when it comes to so much of this stuff. Um, so they're they're so great. Um, you can see from some of their presentations how much they do. Um, so I, I really, really appreciate our state partners. Uh, next slide. So I'll just have a little bit of background on FIFRA, the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, Rodenticide Act. Um, so it's under FIFRA that EPA regulates production, sale, distribution and use of pesticides in the U.S., as well as imports and exports. Um, it also has to do with registration of pesticides, so the testing of ingredients, health effects, and labeling, which of course is a big part of FIFRA. Uh, next slide. So I have a little bit about the history of FIFRA. I don't think I have time to really get deep into this stuff, so I'll just do a super, super brief overview. Uh, 1947 is kind of when FIFRA was initially enacted under USDA. It was originally meant to kind of monitor the efficacy claims of products for, for farmers. Um, in 1970, the EPA was created under Nixon and given that responsibility to administer FIFRA. And the 1972 amendment, that's what kind of established the modern uh, registration process for pesticides that we use today. Um, and then it's in 2000, early 2000s, that Pesticide Registration Improvement Act or PREA is kind of what established the timetable of fees, um, different timelines associated with pesticide registrations. So there continue to be um, pesticide registration improvement acts or PREA acts that come out. So the latest one was PREA 5 a few years ago. Um, and that's what is implementing some of those bilingual labeling requirements. Um, that I think the, the current rule is to have safety information in Spanish on pesticide labels. Uh, next slide. So uh, here's a bunch more, you know, it's just acronyms all day long um, for a lot of the work we do. So here are just a few other things that kind of influence federal pesticide law. So the federal, uh, there's FIFRA, which we already talked about. Um, the one under that is the FFDCA, the Federal Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act. So that's what authorizes EPA to set tolerances or those maximum residue limits for pesticide residues on foods. Um, the Food Quality Protection Act of 1996, so that's where EPA must must find that a pesticide poses a reasonable certainty of no harm before it can be registered for use on food or feed. And then finally, I included the Endangered Species Act, which maybe you've heard something about recently. Uh, and that that's what actually requires all federal agencies to ensure any action they take will will not likely jeopardize the continued existence of any listed species or destroy or adversely modify any critical habitat for those species. So it's a pretty high bar 
Um, and that's the reason that EPA, you know, it's 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 for any action that federal agencies take. And that includes those registration actions that I was talking about. Um, so for every I registered, you know, there, this extensive evaluation would have to happen under ESA has not been happening. And so that's kind of the, the reason there's so much of this litigation driven recent action to, with ESA. Uh, next slide. So I'm um, going to talk again briefly about FIFRA. Next slide again. So basically under FIFRA, the, the philosophy of FIFRA is to ensure pesticide products will not generally cause unreasonable adverse effects on the environment. Um, so I want to emphasize here that that makes FIFRA kind of a cost benefit analysis. So it's taking into account some of the economic, social and environmental costs of using pesticides, but also benefits of the use of any pesticide. Uh, next slide. So I, I don't think we really need to get into the technical definition of what is a pesticide, but if you want to uh, discuss later, uh, we can for sure. Uh, next slide. So just briefly about um, how pesticides are approved in the US. So a pesticide company will submit that registration data package to EPA. That's going to include studies on acute and chronic and all these different um, elements of the toxicity to different animals, to humans, the pesticides, environmental fate, degradation, all this other stuff. After review of that data package, EPA will grant registration with agreed label data and directions for use. Only about one in 35,000 chemicals survive from initial lab testing to the market. And that process is going to take years. Uh, typically involve over 140 tests, and um, that can cost hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars. So the continued use of a pesticide is, is supervised by FIFRA. Uh, next slide. So under FIFRA, uh, that's also kind of what sets certain pesticides as restricted use. Um, so that's, that's when only certified applicators may purchase or supervise the application of restricted use pesticides. And the records of sales and use of those are required to be maintained. Uh, next slide. So this is the registration review process. Um, EPA is supposed to be reviewing every registered pesticide at least every 15 years, basically all that to ensure that that risk um, analysis has not changed too much, that it's not creating unreasonable adverse effects in any way. Um, so there's those different steps, and in that orange there, the draft risk assessment stage um, is where there's public comment typically. So there's typically a lot of public comments open um, that are available for people to comment on. Um, a lot of the endangered species stuff, there's been a lot of public comment available. Um, and I know that's those are all read. All the public comments are read and considered. Um, so it is definitely taken into account um, when these actions are done. Um, next slide. So some additional resources, there's our label review manual, which has a lot more information about how um, these labels come to be. For general questions um, on, on that or on registration, um, there's some other links. The National Pesticide Information Center is an EPA grantee that's based out of the Oregon State University, but it's a national resource. They have experts with a hotline, website with so much amazing educational resources on it are for people to unpick all the time when they have pesticide questions, because they really are the experts and they're in our region, which is amazing. So I encourage you to take a look. Um, and if you have any any questions, anything that's not covered today, concerns about anything, you want to get in touch with our regional EPA, um, you can contact me anytime, reach out to me by email, and I will get back to you um, pretty quickly. And I really, yeah, I really appreciate um, being invited to be a part of this board. Everything Washington State Department of Ag does is so great. Um, we got to thank Wendy Sue for being here, as well as Department of Health. Um, we work with them and really, really appreciate all the work they do. Um, so with that, yeah, any questions? We have any in the chat? I don't see any in the chat either. Okay. Thanks, Marie. Um, All right, we'll move on to the polling portion of our meeting. 
planning our next meeting. Um, so we're gonna do an in-person poll here, and then I'm going to put an online poll for the virtual attendees. Um, so we'll, for the in-person, we'll just do a show of hands. Um, okay, so for meeting frequency, oh, someone's raising their, <laughs> raising their hand in the chat. I can't really see who though. Um, no. No? Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so this is for in-person people. So we need to decide the meeting frequency. So we have two options here. We can do two meetings per year, one in-person hybrid like we have today and a virtual only. Or we can do three meetings per year, one in-person in hybrid like today and two virtual only. Um, so I'll go for option number one. Here. Can we ask, if, I mean, since we're here to advise WSDA, I, I think is, yeah. I would want to know, do they see the benefit in the three or, or do they feel like the two would be sufficient? So it's really left up to the board to decide how many times we meet. Okay. Um, <laughs> and there is no language clarifying if it needs to be in person or virtual or hybrid. Um, it's up to the board. Yeah, I, mean, I think there's all that. I think, that, I think it's a great question. I think, you know, it may be beneficial to say two meetings per year, but one can be added because I think if you think about the stuff that's happening right now in the space around the vulnerable, the vulnerable species pilot, the strategies that are coming out, the bulletins, live two stuff, there could be enough things going on that the group really wants to meet and provide feedback three times a year. And then there might be years where that doesn't matter as much. So I think it really depends on, we could say three meetings a year, um, or we could say two. And then I think the group just needs to be comfortable with the idea. You might get a, a request from us to hold a special meeting. Yeah. yeah. So either way, I think it works. Yeah, I think that's good. It's just more for like planning purposes so that we can get you know, organize an event like this. Um, but yeah, if, if an issue comes up and the board decides that we need a meeting, then that can happen at any point. Okay. Okay, I think I'm ready to vote now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, any any other questions about that? Just clarifying, just voting members are voting. Let's go. No. Everybody, because <laughs> it's an yeah, 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 question. Yeah, that's a question. This is not I'm a decision that the board is making that's for anything other than Right. This is just for our planning of the of the next meetings this year. Um, yeah. So, all right. Show of hands for option one. Okay. And then option two. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting. Someone said, I would love to meet three times if we could have one hybrid and two virtual options. I'm going to, um, I'm going to, I'm going to do a poll online in just a second. Just wanted to make sure. <laughs> you do have two hands that are raised right now for Pablo and Kelly. All right, um, Pablo, could you unmute and ask your question? <coughs> oh, sorry, that, that was uh, that was a mistake. Sorry about that. Oh, okay. Um, what about Kelly McDonald? Do you have a question? No, same thing. It was just a mistake. Oh, okay. All right. I'm gonna I'm gonna put the polling questions for you guys now. Um, just a sec.
All right, so it should be a pop up on your screen um, or if you open your chat, there should be a poll. There should be two options. Okay, I think everyone responded. Thank you very much. It looks like through virtual and in person, the first option of two meetings per year, um, one in-person hybrid and one virtual was selected. So thanks everyone for voting on that. We have a couple more questions. All right, so this is our next polling question. So for the spring 2025 in-person hybrid, because we're gonna start planning for that um, soon. Um, should we have it in Thurston County or Skagit County? And then we have other, because we're open to some suggestions. Um, yeah, I'm gonna launch that poll now. 